reason the camera wasn't working, I couldn't sort it out. So I called Poland and of course the default was to restart the computer. So that's what the delay was. So we're working fine now. Uh, I'm glad and again, I apologize for that. And uh, I very much thank everybody for this opportunity. As I've said before, uh, over the many decades I've been involved in the martial arts, I've taken a great interest in the history of our beloved martial art. And I've tried uh, to really dig, dig deep and uh, ask a lot of questions, assemble knowledge from uh, everywhere and anywhere I could. And it's my great you know, pleasure uh, to share it. I think it's my obligation. Uh, the first lecture I did I had a PowerPoint presentation that went to a, a brief overview. And in the second one, I used the PowerPoint presentation to focus in on the five original Kwans and then uh, to show how they were always very similar but separate entities and they never really uh, uh, came together and coalesced as one. And even uh, down the line, when the Kwans became less uh, in the forefront and were replaced by organizations like the ITF and the uh, Kukiwan and, and WTF, that uh, even that kind of unity was, was really not a true unity. So uh, I think I, I handled a lot of material from an overview uh, perspective. And I know that the people that keep tuning in are very interested. So I do know that uh, questions create great opportunities to dig deeper. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll have a lot of questions on, on all aspects of the history. So with that, I'm just going to uh, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, thank, you know, thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, for me to share. It's uh, my pleasure to do. And uh, if I forget to say it at the end, remember, you can always reach out, out to me, uh, ask questions. I prefer questions asked on my Facebook page. This way, when I answer it, it has the added uh, benefit of, of uh, being shared with, with the people that follow my Facebook page. So with that, I'm going to uh, quiet down uh, for the first question, and then I'll open my big mouth again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Greg, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm a little bit tired, so uh, my apologies. <laughs> I'm a little bit laggy today. But I will do my best to, uh, you know, uh, forward all the questions. Uh, so, okay, we can start. Uh, some of them are quite long, actually, so uh, sorry for that, but I think we will manage. So the first question, uh, Taekwondo is not an age-old Korean martial art, but it is created after the Second World War. But uh, did not General Che Hong-hee contribute to the historical myths? The later so-called naming commission decides uh, to investigate the history of martial arts and in his books, for example, the condensed encyclopedia, uh, there are chapters about the origins and development of martial arts. To be honest, he also describes uh, in, this, uh, in his books that he scientifically developed, systematized, and named Taekwondo. So the question is, uh, did General uh, Che contribute to the historical myths of uh, martial arts? Yes, I, I, think, I think the evidence is quite clear that he did. And uh, it was common. Uh, I addressed some of this earlier in some of the talks that we know Korea has a very la a long and very proud history. Uh, they have a great tr traditions and a culture that dates back some 5,000 years. So uh, when, the, when the Western powers were starting to make outreaches to the East, they looked to... Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, trade with them, however you want to uh, define that. But in, in that aspect, Japan was the first Asian country that really began to westernize in a sense. And uh, they took advantage of, of Korea, which is, was situated between three giants, uh, Russia, uh, Japan itself, and uh, China. So it was a stepping stone to greater Asia and it was exploited historically and 
uh, you know, in the 1890s, there was a Japan fought a war with Russia and a war with China. And uh, it resulted in Japan dominating Korea for about 10 or 15 years before they actually uh, annexed it and made it part of the Japanese empire. So when World War II ended and the Japanese were defeated, there was a great national push to reinvigorate this wonderful Korean traditions and, and bring back their culture and to teach again their history. Remember, the language was outward. Uh, they were given Japanese names. They were, they were in effect made second class Japanese citizens. So one of the things that uh, General Choi did was speak in glowing terms about martial arts in the past, from India to China to Japan, uh, and, and said that uh, for one country to claim they began martial arts is like a country claiming to have invented fire. Certainly fire appeared around the world at different points. It wasn't like country X discovered or invented fire and then sent smoke signals around the world to teach the rest of the people, here are the instructions how to make fire. That, that never happened because people didn't know what smoke was because there was no fire. So if there was smoke signals, nobody could read the smoke signals. So, so General Choi was not the only Korean to engage in this nationalist push. It was in fact the official policy and there were laws putting it in place by the Sigmund Rhee administration. Sigmund Rhee, if you remember, was the first president of Korea. And when Park Chung-hee took over in a military coup, he continued that. So the Koreans could not say that Taekwondo is a form of karate. They could not say it came from karate because then they would credit their, their uh, enemy, their nemesis, Japan, who they resented. So that was just not allowed. So what General Choi did was speak about how Korea had these glorious martial arts in the past. And uh, he took advantage of some of the myths that were being circulated to pump up Korean pride and Korean nationalism. So I believe if you read his 1965 book, you will see that he talks about 1300 years. And then about six, seven, eight, ten 10 years later, the Kukiwan and WTF start saying the same thing, but now it grew to 2000 years. So uh, Taekwondo is different things to different people. What Taekwondo was to General Choi was a name that had Korean origins and it was made Korean, by Koreans in Korea. The Taekwondo that other people do was naturally different from what General Choi did. So yes, he was involved in what was the trend at the time and even the law at the time to promote things Korean. And certainly Koreans were not going to be saying Taekwondo is karate or Taekwondo is Korean karate, even though it was marketed that way. It was a marketing ploy, but it, it went against what uh, the, uh, the sentiment was in Korea. So that's why it had to get a new name. It had no links to, to China or, or uh, Japan. And then he made his patterns after these uh, great Korean patriotic figures uh, throughout Korean history. And that was the way he centered on making what he called Taekwondo, Taekwondo. And of course, the other independents all had their own path. And the WTF uh, focused on uh, the unique, the, the new and, and really unique uh, sports sparring rules. So, uh, so I, I do think that that was all part of the narrative. But if you read that same book, the 1965 book, and every other book that General Che wrote about Taekwondo, he clearly acknowledges that he had training in karate when he was in Japan for his academic education. So he acknowledged the Japanese roots and he looked to minimize them. And uh, one of the ways he, he did that was to use the scientific uh, uh, methods and pseudoscience to give it this, this ore that it is a, a new modern 
scientific martial art. So that's the way I would uh, answer that question. Um, so, so thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have a reference to our last uh, Zoom session. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, the nine quans, uh, the, the nine quans coming together in 1978, unified with the power of Kim Un Yong. Uh, could you say something more? How did that happen? And uh, also, there is a supplement uh, question. The slide that you showed of the nine quans signing the picture had ten listed instead of nine. Yes. Okay. So it's very clear to back up. And to restate, there are only five original quants. There are only five. And original means, by, by definition that I'm using, uh, people can argue with the definition, it's no problem. But the defini definition I use for original quants means they were open prior to 1950. Because 1950, on June 25th, there was an all-out assault by the communist and the Korean War engaged in a in, uh, 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 horrific battle. And that fighting lasted three years. It caused great turmoil, uh, destruction, death, and chaos in Korean society. So that's the reason we, wa we use 1950. Because when, the, when they signed the armistice on July 27, 1953, Society started uh, to uh, come back to some sense of normalcy. By that time, the five original Kwans were still there, but three of them were now led by different leaders. They also used different names. And those five had dissensions among themselves. So a group split off from the Chengdu Kwan and opened another Kwan. A group split off from the Changmu Kwan and opened another Kwan. A group uh, split off from the uh, Jido Kwan and made another group. So now we're up to eight. And we know at this time, actually uh, prior to the war, General Choi was teaching karate, rudimentary basic karate to his troops in the military. And in 1954, also after the war ended, that's why it's not one of the original Kwans, he formally established the Oda Kwan. So now we're up to nine Kwans. Six of them were headed by people who studied karate in Japan or uh, Chinese martial arts in Manchuria or, for, or Japanese martial arts from a book. Three of... Three others were splinter quans, giving us nine quans. But there was still further dissension. Students would break away, make their own schools. And they estimate that there were some 40 to 60 quans in operation throughout the 60s and 70s. And uh, they numbered the nine quans because they felt those were the ones that were linked the most direct to the five. And the tenth one was listed as an administrative quan that anybody else could fall under, like a generic one uh, that if yours wasn't specifically listed, you would still be able to find a home in the Kukiwan. Uh, the Kukiwan, of course, was the central gymnasium for the Korean Taekwondo Association. It became the world headquarters of uh, Taekwondo, the Korean Taekwondo Association was the group that uh, fought very hard to unify the Kwans. Now, how did it happen? Again, very simply, the Kwans organized in 1961 and they adopted a brand new name. It was a compromise name of Taesudo. So the KTA was the Korean Taesudo Association. Not to be confused, with the Korean Taekwondo Association that General Choi set up in 1959 that included this, uh, the six early Kwans. So this group formulated around these new and unique sports sparring rules. Judo and wrestling had the grappling, boxing had the hands, 
and uh, they looked to make a sport that focused on the feet. Of course, karate used some feet, but not me nearly as much as they used with hands. So they, they made sports rules that was like boxing, full contact. You can get a knockout. And there was no stopping in, in, in boxing. You threw a punch, you hit the person, they went down, it, and don't get up, it's a knockout. If you hit them more than they hit you, and you hit them with better blows, at the end, the judges would take the score sheets, tally them up, send them in, and they would declare who the winner was. So this was radically different from the uh, karate or martial art tournaments in place at the time, which were the stop point matches. I see some of the independents here. You guys still might even participate in them where, uh, you know, I would come close to you and uh, I wouldn't hit because contact wasn't allowed. The center referee would yell stop. They turned to the four corner judges who would, would vote. Is it a point or not? So it was radically different. And usually it was the first one to win two points is, the, is declared the winner or three points. Sometimes the tournaments would put two points for a kick to the head as compared to one point uh, hand technique. So these new rules is what got them to coalesce around. And this movement was led by the second generation. They were not the traditional martial artists that learned in Japan that had the focus on the dough, like the first generation leaders, like uh, uh, Grandmaster Lee Wang Guk of the uh, Chengdu Kwan or Grandmaster Wang Ki from the Muda Kwan. Uh, they, they were uh, very much deep into uh, the philosophy as, as General Choi was, and they had a different type of emphasis. Their emphasis was martial art. So the second generation wanted the sport focus and that's what they coalesced around so now when the military coup took over eventually the new military dictatorship started to control everything and they saw taekwondo as a um, cultural and propaganda tool that they could use to br brand the name korea and and this was already dispatched around the world so Park Chung, he put in a very, very, very powerful, uh, gifted, uh, highly educated uh, uh, Dr. Kim Wen Young, who spoke five, if not six languages. Think of the post he had. He was assigned to the Korean embassy in London, a key ally and a major power of the world. He was assigned to the Korean embassy in Washington, D.C. He was then assigned uh, to the United Nations in New York City. From there, he goes home and works in the Blue House in a deputy director position in charge of uh, presidential bodyguards. And uh, he's now put in charge of the KTA. So one of the things he did was they instituted a system of taxation. So now all the schools were going to be taxed. They had to be registered with the government. In order to operate, they need to have a license. What? What was the license? It was a teaching license. You had to be certified. Who did the certification? The KTA through the Kukiwan. So you had to, if you wanted to make a living doing the martial arts, you had to go under their control. There was all kinds of fighting over the issue. This is very, very important. It was a big battle from day one. Who has the power to issue certificates? Why is that important? If you're the one issuing certificates, you have the power. With the power comes money. And with the control and, and all of the trimmings that comes with being the one that is issuing the certificates. So you couldn't open a school unless you were certified by the Kukiwan. You had to have your black belt issued through the Kukiwan. First it was the KTA, but then it, it moved over to the Kukiwan. So all of this made it very difficult to operate a Taekwondo Jang in Korea. You had to be associated with the Kukiwan. Other arts like uh, Hapkido and Subakdo, they did not have this problem because they were not Taekwondo. But uh, as I said in, in uh, one of the previous lectures, Grandmaster Wang Ki, who suffered terribly with political persecution, as did Grandmaster Lee Wang Guk from the Chengdu Kwan under the Sigmund Rhee 
first administration. Wang Qi suffered terribly under the second administration of Park Chung-hee. So uh, eventually, his students' certificates would not be honored for jobs with the government. And he was teaching in the Air Force. He lost those teaching positions. He was teaching in the National Police Force. He lost those teaching positions. So there was a lot of pressure put on people to follow the Kukiwan. If you wanted to be successful, you followed the Kukiwan. So as they look now to silence the Kwans, to lay them to rest, so to speak, they figured we would honor them by numbering them. So they used Arabic numerals to honor their place in history. And they had a formal document made up where the heads at the time of those Kwans signed this document saying the Kwans are officially retired and honored by the Kukiwan and the responsibility for moving forward would be rolled into or underneath the umbrella of the Kukiwan, which was by then the World Taekwondo Academy. So that's why there was nine of them listed. They couldn't list 40 or 60. Uh, they listed the nine because any fair evaluation of prior to 1960 will determine there was nine Kwans in operation pretty much on the same plane. But there was only five that were original and there was only six that were headed by people who studied during the occupation from sources abroad. So that's how it all happened. There was a lot of um, pressure so that was the stick, right? You know, we have the carrot to, to, to lead people to come to, and then we have the stick to, to, to beat them or to push them into submission. And the carrot was what? Look at all of the things that the Kukiwan was offering. Certification. They were officially dispatching people overseas. If, if ITF people know anything about the African continent when it comes to Taekwondo, the WTF dominates there. It's not even close. Why? Because Koreans, leaving a very poor country, were not going to emigrate to Africa because they didn't have the economic opportunities there that they did at, the, at other uh, old world or uh, first world countries or, or uh, you know, uh, throughout the South Pacific. Uh, so there was a lot of resources to be had or to benefit from from the Kukiwan. It is the Mecca of Taekwondo. There's no question about that. And you want to be able to grab those benefits. And what was also happening, there was the push to the Olympics. But 1980, Taekwondo got officially recognized by the Olympics. Not as official sport in the program, that came in 1994. But they got officially recognized by the Olympics in 1980. Prior to that, they were already appearing in the Asian Games and other leading major international uh, uh, sporting events around the world. So this was where a lot of people gravitated towards. Plus, when General Choi, who was the head of the first world governing body for Taekwondo, when he moved the ITF from Seoul, Korea, where it was founded, in 1966 to Toronto, Canada in 1972, a lot of Koreans didn't, didn't like that because they felt Korean martial arts should be headquartered in Korea. And of course, General Trey exiled because of the political persecution that others had, uh, had, had suffered uh, under the uh, brutal military dictatorship. So a lot of Koreans just said, I'm patriotic. I want to I want to reconnect to a headquarters in Korea. So they switched to that as well. So there was many, many reasons. And they involved both, you know, uh, uh, the, the carrot and the stick to, to, to draw people in and to push them there. When it came to places like the ITF, if you read uh, Alex Gillis's book, and I highly recommend it, you will see the great lengths that, the military dictatorship did through the KCIA to keep the Korean expatriates in check all around the world. They also used the KCIA 
to pressure the masters that were with the ITF, and every single one of them left, except the most loyal student ever of Taekwondo, Grandmaster Riki Ha. Uh, General Trey loved Grandmaster Ri, and he promoted him. He was the first person to promote it, ninth degree by General Choi uh, uh, in the ITF. So the ITF was a broken organization for many, many reasons. And the KTA, Kukiwan, and WTF was growing for many, many reasons. So the political situation and the government set up back home simply made it impossible to exist with Taekwondo in Korea unless you were part of the Kukiwan apparatus. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we have a question in terms of the techniques of different sports. So uh, throws are in general chess manuals, therefore part of a quote, whole unquote Taekwondo, but why do most clubs not teach them and should they be doing so? Okay, so from the history side, we know Taekwondo is a mix of martial arts. What do I mean by that? Taekwondo, as it was named by people in the military, were doing a martial art in the military, starting in the, in the, the Republic of Korea's army, and spread to the other branches of the Korean military. But it all began in the Korean army, and what they were doing in the Korean army, they first named Taekwondo. So, if you look at any of the five original Kwans, you will see they were all had grappling, throwing, joint locks, whatever, because people here are much more well-versed in that than I am, but karate had those things. The Judo Kwan opened in a Judo school. It opened in a Judo school. So what, what the soldiers did in the army under General Choi's command was they took various martial arts that they had connected to them at the time that they were exposed to at the time so in taekwondo we have upward punch like an uppercut we have a crescent punch which is like a hook uh we have throws and grappling and joint manipulation like hapkido does and judo and wrestling does and what the the soldiers told me was it was a consolidated art it was a mix of the martial arts around. Not to be confused with MMA today. They simply took techniques and applied them. If they work, they kept them. If they didn't, they removed them. Because it was about fighting. It was about combat. It was about self-defense. So why do schools not teach that today? I don't know. That's a question you have to direct to the individual schools. I know from seeing some faces on here that you all teach these things in your school. And all I can tell you is from a general sense as a historian looking back and somebody that's living in the present that has traveled the world extensively, your students will do what you teach them. They will retain what you teach them, what you emphasize. Your students will also practice the things that you make mandatory on your tests. So if you don't test required knowledge, if you don't give them a written test, they won't retain, retain. they won't even study this stuff. Uh, retention's a whole nother thing. If you don't give them verbal exams and ask them to articulate things, they won't. Because they are going to learn what you teach them. And what you teach them and what you emphasize and what you demand in testing to be promoted is what they will learn. So if you don't do wholesome soul, if you don't do throws in your school and you don't test them, they're not going to learn them unless they go somewhere else. So uh, on our... Day one in our school, white belts learn to do a simple tumble, a forward roll, and then they learn a backward roll, and they learn a front break fall and a side break fall. And after they're comfortable with hitting that mat and falling on the mat, we start putting in simple throws. And then we add in grappling, and we test on all these things. We implement free sparring. What is free sparring? Free sparring is not tournament sparring. Tournament sparring is tournament sparring. What is tournament sparring? I don't know. 
show me your rules and I'll tell you what tournament sparring is. In uh, uh, the military Taekwondo, free sparring is you are free, free to use any and all available means of attack and defense. So if you're not doing that in free sparring, you're not doing free sparring. So uh, it's, a, I believe, a big disservice to students in 2020 to not be taught these things, but it's not simple enough to just teach them. You must test them. And one of the things that General Choi did before he died, he asked people like the Grandmaster Lao Wei Ming and the Grandmaster Wim Boss and others to formulate a category of prearranged free sparring to be used in tournaments. So some of these techniques that are falling by the wayside would now have another incentive to be trained because it's a tournament category for competition. So uh, clearly Taekwondo is a mix of the martial arts that were available to them at the time. It is a consolidation of that. And if, uh, uh, if you're not doing that, I'll tell you what General Che would say. Ask your teacher for money back. You, you were cheated. But uh, uh, that's how it answered that from historical perspective and somebody that's living in, in 2020 today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question. Um, General Che Hong, he emphasized that Taekwondo is based on science, in particular modern Newton's physics and some knowledge of biomechanics. Uh, I think he rooted his system of primary and secondary vital points on modern science, biology, Western medicine, others base vital points and pressure point on traditional Chinese medicine. Did General Che uh, ever refer to traditional Chinese medicine? If yes, what was his opinion about, about it? Okay, uh, good question. I don't know if I have any solid answers for that. I do know in my personal conversations with General Choi, he did speak about Eastern medicine and uh, uh, Eastern uh, methods of healing. Uh, in his writings, he speaks about consulting experts in a, in a broad uh, spectrum of fields to get input. The history section in his books was written by a college uh, president and a professor that was a lieutenant colonel in the army. He was the one that uh, manufactured or resurfaced, brought back to life and embellished the Warangdo warriors myth. And uh, so, so we know that he reached out to various uh, experts for, for input. So, um, but as far as uh, the, the uh, actual nitty gritty of that detail, I don't know if I could uh, add anything more substantial to that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, last session you mentioned uh, in ITF sport, there were five categories to compete in and now there are four. Uh, why did that happen? And why do some ITFs competitions have prearranged set sparring categories and others don't? Okay, so I will, uh, a, a bunch of people around the world are helping us to try to compile the results of 1978, the second ITF World Championships in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma in the United States. And, uh, We had, in the beginning, sparring, and we had patterns. General Choi was a martial artist as compared to a sportsman. So his, his philosophy was, you must be a well-rounded martial artist, not a specialist. So he devised a tournament that had four categories of competition. Sparring and patterns. Power test, which is not breaking. It involves breaking, yes, but it is not breaking that you will see in open tournaments. Power test in an ITF tournament means everybody must break with the foot sword. Foot sword by kicking with a side piercing kick. 
And for instance, everybody starts off breaking five boards. You break the five boards, you move forward to the next round. So there's no um, creativity. You don't design your own break. There's a scientifically, or I don't know if scientifically is the word for it, but there is a board holder that, you know, is an engineer constructed to give uniform resistance. So you, you don't have people holding the boards. You have, a, you have this mechanical board holder. If you broke the five boards, you advance to the next round. They put a sixth board in. You break the six boards, you go to the next round until you're down to the person who broke the most boards. Usually that used to be somewhere around 10, 11 boards in an ITF World Championship. So you would get a gold medal for foot sword or, or side piercing kick. And there are five categories for, for power test that are all set up like that. They're just using different tools of the body for the breaking. And then you had what he called special techniques. Special techniques is another category of breaking because it involves breaking boards. But it is special techniques because you are in the air. You are doing flying breaks. But again, there's no creativity. There is a mechanical board holder constructed by engineers that will, will place a board at a certain height. And then, for instance, Twimo Napchagi, which is flying high kick, you would have to run, leap in the air to hit that board and break it. If you break it, guess what? You move to the next round, and what do they do? They raise the height of that. And that is also repeated for five different categories. So those were the original four categories. Then um, there was a uh, fifth category added that some of the old timers might remember. It was free special techniques. Free special techniques were you run, you jump in the air, and you break as many boards that you can at separate stations, all held by people. And the one that breaks the most boards is the one that is deemed the winner. That category uh, slipped away. And eventually, as I uh, was alluding to earlier, General Choi wanted to add a fifth category. And the fifth category he wanted to add is prearranged free sparring. Prearranged free sparring is Kung Fu theater. It's, it's a, a Saturday, Saturday afternoon, the kids get together and they, they put together a fighting sequence and they filmed it with their old uh, video cameras, right? That's what prearranged free sparring is. You actually create, you design a fighting scene. And I don't know, uh, the different groups do it differently. There's a time limit. There are certain uh, techniques that are mandatory that you do. Uh, it's supposed to be the low kicks and the sweeps and the, and the joint manipulation and the throwing and falling and whatnot. The things that you're not allowed to do in tournament sparring, because why? In tournament sparring, the rules prohibit the techniques that you're allowed to use and the, the target areas you're allowed to score points with. So uh, that is the five categories of ITF Taekwondo uh, championships. And uh, two of the three use them. One calls it prearranged free sparring, which is the, the correct name. And another uses the term Holson Su or self-defense routine. Uh, one of the others uh, has not implemented that. And that is something that that's a question that should be asked to that group as to why. I can tell you that um, the people that General Che had asked towards the uh, end of his life, before he knew he was dying, to, to uh, formulate some kind of rules for this category uh, of new competition, uh, the two main ones went with two different ITFs. And uh, uh, General Che's son uh, had a falling out and he was elected uh, uh, to be the president to succeed his father, and that was overturned. It caused a whole bunch of turmoil. So, so he left, and that, that ITF never implemented that. So I don't know if they have plans to uh, in the future, but that's something I, I can't an answer. That's something that has to be directed towards those uh, uh, ITF uh, leaderships. Uh, but good question. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a quick question with regards uh, your. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. I just uh, just okay. wanted to add one thing. So the five categories of competition in ITF championship is designed to get the all-around best athlete, the all-around best martial artist, the most well-rounded martial artist, the one who is gaining points in sparring, who's gaining points in power tests, who's gaining points in the flying special techniques, who's gaining points in patterns. So at the end of the world championships, the overall winner is presented with a big trophy, male and female. They were the ones that meddled the most in the individual categories. So the WTF has a different concept. Their world championships is sparring and sparring only. I don't know, it's about eight or 10 years ago, they set up a Pumse world championship. But you will notice those are done separately during different years at different venues with different competitors. I am not aware of any competitor and I could be wrong. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just not aware of it. I'm not aware of any competitor who competes at the world championship level, level with WT in both uh, Pumse and, and Kurugi, the, the, what they call their sparring. I, I could be wrong, but uh, the ITF tournament rules, according to General Choi, is to reward the best overall martial artist. So I, I thought that was important to add. I'm sorry for that. Please go ahead with the next question. Okay, thank you. So we have a question about the original free sparring. And the question is, was it done with no contact? Uh, yes, I think, I think that um, it was pretty clear in the original five quans that the... Uh, Original sparring was no contact. It's clear from records that we have. It is clear from firsthand accounts of people who trained there. And more importantly, when you read about how Taekwondo evolved from a martial art to a martial sport, you will see that it was the Jido Kwan and Dr. Yoon, the second uh, Kwan Janim, uh, who was probably the highest ranking Korean to study Japanese martial arts. Some accounts have him as fifth or even seventh degree in karate. He had a school in Japan and a school in, in Korea as well. So in the Jido Kwan, Dr. Yoon uh, introduced the bamboo uh, uh, jackets or uh, uh, chest protectors that we used back in the 1950s. And this was, was, this was what was adopted when they uh, applied to become a member of the Korean Olympic Committee. They used this type of equipment, and uh, Dr. Udo Moining's uh, book shows how the equipment evolved from bamboo into present day now with the uh, uh, electronic sc uh, scoring protector. And... Uh, so the Jido Kwan had this emphasis already on sparring. They were very, very into sparring. And the next leader of the Jido Kwan, Grandmaster Lee Chung Wu, who I interviewed, very, very, very influential figure in Kuki Taekwondo and the WTF. He's probably the most influential martial artist on that side of the uh, style differences. He emphasized the sparring and he promoted it that way. And he said, if we try to follow Kung Fu from China and Karate from Japan with patterns, we will constantly be behind them because they are light years ahead as far as having their own set of forms. So he did not think it was wise Maybe why is not the right word. He found it was more beneficial to have your own identity and be accepted in the, in the uh, international community as a standalone martial art by emphasizing the sparring rules and more importantly, devising unique 
rules that were never in place before. And when he formed the Korean Taste Do Association, he had a very powerful ally, a general uh, that was in the military dictatorship. And this general told him, minimize the first generation leaders. You move forward with the sport version. I will get you in the Korean Olympic uh, Committee. And uh, that's what he did. The Korean Olympic Committee at first resisted and even rejected their approach. And the, this, their, their, the Korean Olympic Committee said, it's not a martial art. It's not a sport. It's a martial art. So Grandma Lee Chung-woo responded by saying, well, no, 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 no. We have made our own martial sport. And they had to... They had to show the Korean Olympic Committee how different their rules were. And that's where I said before, <coughs> it was the, the corner judges with score sheets, the continuous sparring with knockouts and so forth. So in 1962, they were allowed in the very prestigious Korean National Sports Festival. This predates... Uh, the occupation, this predates the liberation. And it was allowed in as a demonstration sport in 1962. And in 1963, it was given official sport status in this very prestigious domestic uh, sporting event. Uh, what, what Koreans would, would consider the, the, the top um, sporting event of the year. So they they needed to throw away that non-contact stop match type of fighting because that was associated with martial arts. Because remember, the theory of martial arts is you can't hit somebody because it's so deadly and we're going to hit these vital spots and we're going to cause such damage to somebody. So we can't have a sport. So these brilliant, creative thinking out of the box second generation leaders devised sport rules that were unique and were very successful. And that's what eventually led to Taekwondo becoming Olympic sport. So it did be begin as that stop match um, tournaments that I used to compete in the early seventies. They were all over the place. They are still popular today until the WTF rules started uh, becoming uh, more popular around the world. But yes, so uh, it, it definitely did begin that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, okay, many Taekwondo practitioners do not perform sine wave and stick, uh, stick to traditional Taekwondo. And also there are parties of, or federations that further develop uh, Taekwondo techniques. Are there aspects of Taekwondo that General Che Hong he could not document in the encyclopedia before his death? Or is the encyclopedia a complete documentation? Okay, so uh, um, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, it is a complete documentation of the system he left us. And he did constantly revise his books to adding more and more techniques. I believe one of the last techniques he added was uh, something called the tumbling kick, which you see now in a lot of this uh, gymnastics type routine of martial arts. And I remember the story when he was uh, uh, trying to get these pioneers to do things and they didn't think it was possible. One was Batoro Chagi, twisting kick. And they couldn't, no, no, no. And he, he would have to actually physically take their leg and move it and say, yes, your leg can go this way. I want you to do it, work it out. And the tumbling kick was no different. These martial artists said, no way, no way. And uh, he said, yes way. He'd knock them in the head or whatever. And he would insist they do it and would, would uh, help them through it like I would do in my school somebody would spot them you know you, you steal from other 
types of activities, right? Gymnastics, they don't come out and do these, uh, the things they do the first day on the mat. They're, they're work through the basics and then they have people that spot them that actually turn their body. So that's how I would do it with the thing like the tumbling kicks and whatnot. So he was quite happy with the system that he left, but he also left us uh, the next generations the responsibility of continuing to develop and to add to, refine and make better. And, and I think that we see uh, uh, some of that, some of that today. So his his book is not one. His his books are several. They go from 1959, when he wrote the first book ever on Taekwondo, to 1965, when he wrote the first English book on Taekwondo, to the 1980s when he wrote a 15 volume encyclopedia of Taekwondo, to the, to the 1990s where he wrote uh, condensed versions of it and to the early 2000s before he passed away with uh, his books on uh, uh, the uh, moral code and on his uh, memoirs. So what he did was complete for his system, but he tasked the, the future generations to keep building on, on what he gave us. And you know we have uh, several people around the world that he promoted to ninth degree grandmaster, uh, led by Grandma Sariki Ha, who, who travels around the globe, making himself available uh, to teach. And um, all of, of his followers, they in turn use their own brain and take what was taught to them by their teacher, by General Che, and by the, the writings and the teachings and the written manuals and from Grandmaster Ri, and they add to it and I think that's the that is the way of of the martial arts. So yes, General Choi's books are both complete and incomplete. It it it, it fully documented what he left here, and we need to add on to it. And one of the things is fifteen volume encyclopedia. Uh, somebody came up with a really great idea of adding a sixteen volume to to uh, fine tune some things that weren't clearly understood or maybe some things that were lacking and another uh, creative uh, person uh, ran with that idea and made a 16 volume where he patterned it after the 15 volume encyclopedia adding the, the 16th one and in it put Kodang and Unam which was brilliant because now you have another volume that has the lost pattern and the replaced pattern in it uh, in the same format. So you have the foot diagrams, the, the, the text, and all the pictures and from different angles and whatnot. Uh, you know, we are only limited by our own imagination. So think, be creative, expand. Uh, Taekwondo needs it, and we all benefit from it. So that's how to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and staying in the topic of encyclopedia, uh, why does the 2004 edition of Encyclopedia somehow disregard the 1999 edition? Okay, that's a, qu a question I've dealt with on Facebook quite a lot. Whoa, what happened? Well, there we go. I don't know what happened. I'm back. Okay. Uh, so, uh, forget about all these conspiracy theories. It's pretty simple. Why? The answer is pretty simple. And it goes to publishing. The people who published the 1999 edition published it in Canada, or it was a group in Canada that published it. Uh, the previous edition, I think, was 1995, if I'm not mistaken. So that 1995 edition was published elsewhere by a different publisher, a different printer. So when they wanted to create a new book to add in some things uh, that came after 1999, they didn't have the benefit of getting the 1999 booklet, the plates, the computer setup, whatever the, the art is. Uh, there's some people on here that have uh, written books. They can explain that process. So they had no templates to work from. 
So they work from the templates of 1995. And the 1995 book had mistakes that were corrected by the 1999 book. So the mistakes in the 1995 book were repeated in the 2004 edition because that was not the focus. The focus was on adding the things that happened from 1999 to when, when the book was printed. So that is a manufacturing thing. It's a marketing thing. It's a sales thing because there are two different entities selling the two different books. Uh, but from what I understand, General Che left his, um, the rights to his books or whatever that is called uh, to a, a Chang Hong Foundation. And uh, that was administered by the ITF uh, headquarters where it's been since 1985 in Vienna, Austria. So I am sure if somebody was to take the 1995 template and would make the corrections in the 1999 book did on those templates, and now they would make a 2020 version, it would be fine. But nobody's done that. And that's another reason why we should not be so fragmented and fighting with each other. It's just another concrete way of how we the students suffer. But good, good question. I get that often, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question, um, also about uh, the second part of our Zoom meetings. Uh, you mentioned that it was a race to get to Switzerland to get into the Olympics and WTF got into it and ITF didn't. Did Kim Un Yong have more political power than Choi Hong Hee? And what made the IOC favor WTF more? Okay, so very, very complex question. No, no easy answers and no, um, uh, no real right answers for everything. It was a combination of things. Kim Un Young was brilliant. He had uh, the opportunity to become an International Olympic Committee member. He, since he was so br brilliant, since he was such a very good politician, he knew how to maneuver. He orchestrated his way up to the top. He got on their executive board. He was vice president. I'm pretty sure he would have been president, except for the scandals that happened prior to him getting arrested. So uh, again, the perfect person to be tapped to lead the Korean Taekwondo Association. But this man was way much more than a Taekwondo administrator because he was not a Taekwondo uh, practitioner, master, or, or leader. He was just a, 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 a very, very talented administrator. So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation, what's going on in the 70s in the Korean, on the Korean Peninsula? People might not realize this, but South Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. North Korea actually had a higher GDP and a stronger economy than South Korea. Until Park Chung-hee orchestrated what's called the miracle on the Han. It's an economic miracle, unprecedented in the history of the world, what happened in South Korea. So as South Korea rose like a rocket economically, what comes with a rocketing economy? Affluence, money, influence. South Korea today hosts, I don't know, the G20 or G13, I, I, I forget. I mean, they're a host country. They're, they are one of the uh, top economies in the world. This all started under the, that brutal military dictator. That's why he's loved by Koreans and hated by Koreans. If you're on the side where he's, his fist is squeezing your neck, you despised him like General Choi did. But if you're on the side where you now have, you know, they had 5G before in America even knew what the heck 5G was. I mean, it's, it's amazing what South Korea has become. So if you know anything about the IOC, the IOC is headquartered in Switzerland. Why? 
oh yeah, Switzerland centrally located in Europe, uh, multi languages, and it's uh, politically neutral. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody know anything about the Switzerland banking system? So anybody know how much money the IOC has? The answer is no. You know why? Because they're in Swiss bank accounts. So nobody knows how much they have. What we do know is they spend $3.24 million per day, per day, $3.24 million per day on promoting sport around the world. So it is a very rich organization. Juan Samaranch was brilliant. Kim Won Young partnered with him. Juan Samaranch took the Olympics, which was dying, and brought them back to life. How did he do that? He made cities bid on them. He made cities build the infrastructure. And he retained the advertising rights, the, the, the broadcast rights. So the IOC makes all the money from TV from all around the world. And it's not just TV, radio, internet now. All the broadcast rights are retained by the IOC. So they do nothing because the TV crews come in and set up the infrastructure they need. The whole city builds the infrastructure they need. The whole city makes the money in the tickets. And all this money run, pours in from around the world from the broadcast revenue. Untold millions of dollars. And the IOC takes that and doles out chunks of it to, to entities like the WTF, to like the Tokyo for 2020 Olympics to be next year. So the Tokyo Organizing Committee will get huge influx of, of cash from the IOC. Uh, so everything in the IOC is about money. What does South Korea have? In a rising economy, these corporate conglomerates, uh, there's a word for them, chables, I think they're called in Korean. Um, and they really are very powerful in Korea. And with them comes a lot of, a lot of money. So there were, was all kinds of money being filtered to the IOC to support Taekwondo. What did the ITF had? Nothing. They had a little guy that was screaming and crying and complaining. How can you put Taekwondo in the Olympics? I made the name. I first formulated it. I'm still alive. These people are not Taekwondo, blah, blah, blah. You know how that story goes, and you know how successful it was. It wasn't at all. It wasn't even close. But what did General Choi do in 1980? Introduced Taekwondo to North Korea. He got the support of the North Korean government financially and otherwise, right? They, they filled the ITF staff with instructors they dispatched all around the world. Uh, this conference is being hosted in Poland, which had ITF instructors from North Korea dispatched to Poland to teach. Anybody knows anything about ITF Taekwondo in Poland? They are a powerhouse today. Eastern, European, Eastern Europe is a powerhouse and Russia is a powerhouse. Why? Because a lot of it is traced to these instructors that came and built up these programs and the governments in place at the time supported it. And we can go on and on and all, all, how all that happened. So we're trying to get in the Olympics and who do we have helping us? North Korea, not much help. Financially, not much help. Um, political wise, not much help. help. And what did we have? A boycott of the 80 Olympics, a boycott of the 84 Olympics. Who's boycotting the Seoul Olympics? North Korea is. And they got Cuba too and, and a handful of other countries. They lit, led a boycott for the 88 Olympics. They wanted to co-host the Olympics. And the IOC said, well, we only give the Olympics to one city, not to two different countries. But due to this special situation on the Korean Peninsula, we will consider that. What's your proposal? And the IOC actually seriously considered giving three sports, four sports, even five sports to North Korea to co-host along with, guess what? ITF Taekwondo. So ITF Taekwondo would have been uh, uh, introduced as a demonstration sport in North Korea during the 88 Seoul Olympics, but the deal never happened. 
and the deal fell apart with all kinds of problems of how do we go through the DMZ? How, how does the press get access? How do we credential them? What about security? And so many things. Now, the Soviet Union in those days was all supporting North Korea. But since they had their Moscow Olympics boycotted and they boycotted the Los Angeles Olympics four years later in 84, there was little tolerance around the world for another boycott. So almost everybody showed up in Seoul. The Seoul Summer Olympics in 88 were the most successful Olympics up to the time, most countries, all this other uh, kind of things, and a couple of bitter countries boycotted. Then what happens? You know, G General Trey would show up to these meetings. They, he'd try to crash meetings. Uh, there was all kinds of things going on. We had a lobbying campaign, and the IOC was listening. But then what happened? You ever hear that wall in Germany? Begins with a B. Uh, uh, Berlin Wall, right? Berlin Wall gets knocked down. The Soviet Union collapsed. Poland, Lech Walesa, the Solidarity Movement, right? Where is the Iron Curtain? It no longer exists. Europe is united. Communism has failed, except for, I think, four uh, countries that, well, even China's not, I mean, Communist Party, but they abandoned their uh, socialist economy and now moved to a capitalist economy. But that's how much the world changed. So what happens when all this is going on in the early 90s? 1994, there's no more divided world. There's no more of the IOC appeasing two factions. And what did the WT do? WTF at the time now goes in to all these countries that they set up diplomatic relations with. There was countries that were formed that didn't exist before, right? They didn't exist before. They were all under the USSR, but now they are sovereign countries. And the WTF goes in with this generous program of converting them from ITF to WTF. And now they go to the IOC and they say, our Taekwondo that you approved back in 1980, that we had a demonstration sport in 1988, that you allowed us to do in 1992 again, is now fully around the world because the communist bloc ended. In 1994, IOC gets approval as official sport and has been in, in every Olympic program since 2000. So that's what happened. So yes, there was a lot of fighting. There was a race to get there. And there was no way that General Che could beat Kim Won young There's no way the ITF could beat the WTF. And there's no way that North Korea could support South Korea. Uh, North Korea could support uh, this original Taekwondo over the sport Taekwondo that South Korea was doing just was not going to happen. So again, a very, very good question. It's a very complex issue. And I only touched on some of uh, uh, the factors that contributed to uh, the, the WT winning the race. And now in 2020, ITF Taekwondo is in the Olympics. We've made that deal. And the ITF will never supplant the WTF. The WT is the official International Federation for Olympic Taekwondo. It will always be. There's no knocking it out. There's no supplanting. There's no replacing it. There's no hope that it's going to collapse and wither away and we're going to, uh, you know, ride uh, into the rescue. Uh, it's all fantasy. So the question now is, how do we get the ITF to work under the WT umbrella? And uh, that's very difficult and it's ongoing. But, but that's a really good question. And, and again, I only uh, try to touch on the surface of some of the many contributing factors, but thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, uh, the third part of Taekwondo and me is only in Korean. Is there someone working on an English translation? Uh, maybe you know why isn't there yet an English one? Are there any legal or other problems? And uh, can you tell 
if there is something interesting um, in terms of contents of uh, the part three. Okay. Um, I forget where part two ends off, but obviously part three picks up from there. And uh, probably the most interesting thing uh, for me that I was able to find uh, in it is uh, some names of the current leaders of the ITFs, you know, colleagues and friends of mine. And of course, uh, that third volume, they correct uh, Dosan's a, uh, birth year. So uh, I wish everybody else would correct it just because you, know, you, you can't go back and correct previous editions, but it, it's in there. So, so they obviously realized that uh, that was a mistake and it was corrected. So that's interesting. Um, I can't really speak much more about it because it's in Korean. And so I don't know what I'm missing, but I know, I know we're all missing something. And is somebody translating it? I've asked uh, about that. I don't think anybody's translating it. The legality of it, I don't know. I'm assuming that uh, those rights were left to the Changhang Foundation, which again is administered by the ITF in Vienna, Austria. So, um, I have heard, I have heard rumors that the the family was going to do all three volumes, con uh, like condensed into one, and and release it, but. I, again, that's just a rumor, so I have no idea. Uh, obviously, in Volume 3, there is a General Choi's account of what happened in all the turmoil uh, in, you know, in uh, 2001 and 2002 prior to him passing away. So I believe there's a wealth of information that's in there. And for, from my perspective as a researcher, I wish there was a Korean that would read this and give me an idea of what was in there. I think I, I have translated the, the table of contents so I know like what the chapters are titled. Uh, but once I know a general idea of what's in there, then I can say, oh, so you, you read this and you're saying in chapter seven, it deals with X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me in that chapter seven, that deals with X, Y, Z is how did he refer to Y as? What did he say about Z? So that would be quite helpful. So if anybody knows, anybody that um, reads Korean, I have, I have, uh, uh, you know, thanks to, th thanks to so many friends and colleagues that help out with all kinds of projects. You know, I really wish I was a professor at a university because I'd have all the college students trying to get credit and boost their score, you know, doing internships uh, and would do all this work for me, but I don't have that. But I do get a lot of people that really help out with wonderful aspects. And one of them scanned the entire book and made it into a PDF. So if we had somebody that can read Korean, I can get them a, a, a you know, PDF and they could uh, start, you know, that process. I know people have, I've, I've had to deal with professional translators and it's very, very expensive. So that's not an option for somebody like me because I don't have the, the uh, funds to expend to do that. So what I always thought would be, would be helpful is to get a Korean to read it and give me an overview. Then when I see what's uh, get a better idea, I can, I can drill down and say, Oh, what does it say about that? And, you know, and whatnot. So, you know, I, I do have it here. It's it's right here on my shelf. Um, they're hard to find. I don't know if they print them anymore. So some of those legal questions I can't answer, uh, other than the fact that I, I did see uh, some kind of documentation that said this Chang Hong Foundation administers that. But that's for lawyers to to sort through and you know figure out how binding they are and 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 whatnot. But uh, it's it's an important. It's an important task that remains uh, undone. So any help that we can get for that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, for all of you, um, Piotr um, attached a document uh, concerning the question uh, that was asked on the chat. The question is uh, about dispatching instructor, ITF instructors to teach around the world. Uh, were they financed by ITF or did they have to pay their own way? Uh, and Piotr uh, attached a file which concerns the uh, correspondence, uh, correspondence about DPRK instructors for Poland. Okay, but maybe Grandmaster, you can uh, elaborate on the Sure, thing. okay. So, prior to the ITF, the first, the first instructor to go abroad to teach Taekwondo was a man named Che Hong Hee. He was an ambassador to Malaysia. He was a two-star major general of the Korean army, one of the founders of the Korean army. He was pushed out of the military. So Park Jung Hee, the military dictator, uh, could uh, consolidate his control. So he was sent to Malaysia as ambassador. So when he went to Malaysia, he started to introduce Taekwondo there. And uh, the month after that, the first four Koreans were dispatched abroad. They were led by Nam Tae Hee. He was a major at the time. And there was three others that were captains at the time. They were deployed to Vietnam in December of 1962, where Major Nam and one of the captains stayed for a full year, one year assignment teaching Taekwondo in Vietnam. This was a result of the 1959 demonstration where the military Taekwondo team went to South Vietnam and Taiwan to introduce Taekwondo there. This was a result of the political connections that General Che had because the Vietnamese, the, the Korean ambassador to South Vietnam was a, a General Che Duc Shin, who was General Che's blood brother. And he was his senior in the military and his elder in, in, in life as well. Uh, they were very, very involved together their whole lives for Korean unification. He was the one that helped set up the Goodwill Tour. He was the one that uh, got the figure that does the flying two direction kick to transfer to the ITF when he was in Germany, because he was the ambassador in Germany. Uh, he was also the foreign minister of, of uh, South Korea. So uh, the two other captains stayed in Vietnam for six months. So those are the first five that were uh, dispatched officially abroad to teach Taekwondo. Uh, General Trey was, was dis, uh, uh, dispatched as on a diplomatic assignment as ambassador, but did teach Taekwondo there. And the, the four in the military were officially deployed to Vietnam in December of 62. In the spring of 1963, a retired lieutenant and a retired master sergeant by the name of Wu, Wu J. Uh, Lim and uh, Kim Bak Man were sent, were requested to come to Malaysia to teach. And they, they set up the Malaysian Taekwondo Association and the Singapore Taekwondo Association. In Vietnam, they set up the Vietnam Taekwondo Association. So it was funny. It was very, very funny. Sad in a way, but Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, all had Taekwondo. The military had Taekwondo. They were still issuing Korean Taekwondo Association certificates from 1959. But in South Korea, there's no Taekwondo, it's Taesudo. So if you don't understand who the original Taekwondo is, you really don't have a grasp on, on the historical timeline. So uh, then uh, towards the end of 1964, two more people get requested to come to Malaysia and Singapore. Their no names are Choi Chang Kyun and Riki Ha. They, ladies and gentlemen, are the first two Koreans to leave Korea with Taekwondo instructor as their occupation on their passport. So all of this is done 
through General Trey's personal connections in the military and in the military government. It's all done by his initiatives. Now, there are many, many, many Koreans that left Korea prior to this and moved abroad all over the world to pursue higher education, to get a better uh, job and whatnot. And uh, in the United States, one of the first was Jun Ri. We call him the father of Taekwondo, American Taekwondo. Uh, Grandmaster Richard Chun was one of the early ones as well. Grandmaster S. Henry Cho, Cho Si Hak, uh, all, all in the, these two in the, in the New York area. Uh, th there were several that came, uh, Captain uh, Jack Wong in Oklahoma City also came very early. He was a lieutenant in the 29th Fist Division under General Choi uh, uh, back in Korea. So there, there were people that went around the world. I independent of Taekwondo, they went for academic. And when they were there, like Jun Ri, they started teaching martial arts. They called it Tang Sudo, or I don't know when they called it Taekwondo, but the official deployment started in, this uh, structure started in 59. And, and that's the, the first ones that went over. Once these instructors were overseas and they built up Taekwondo because it took, took off like wildfire, fly, fire. Uh, it just spread so rapidly. The need increase for more and more to come. So one of the things that the, uh, what happened back in Korea when General Trey finished his diplomatic assignment, he became ambassador at large and the South Korean government sponsored a kooky Taekwondo goodwill tour around the world. They literally went around the world. They left Korea, went to Southeast Asia, uh, went into uh, North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and then uh, back home to Korea. So they literally went around the world. And they used that as the base of operation to start sending more instructors. And those countries, if you look like Egypt and Italy and uh, Turkey, these were all Singapore, Malaysia, all founding member nations of ITF. And uh, Germany was a was the uh, very, very close ally. West Germany was very close ally with South Korea. Many Korean men went to West Germany. Many, many of them went to dig coal out of the mines and send, send that money home. Some of them knew martial arts and taught it on the side. My teacher went to Germany, but he was college educated, he was ROTC and he was an x-ray technician. So he was sent to Germany as a x-ray technician. That's where he met his wife because there were many, many Korean nurses there. And he was approached by the consulate. Uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Lee sang Koo was uh, uh, recruited the Koreans that were teaching martial arts. Uh, I have the newspaper clippings. My teacher was in several news, news clips. Uh, newspapers so you know the consulate monitors these things and said oh here's an asset so he's the one that recruited him for the itf just as uh grandmaster moon who is the one that does the two directional kick on the on the plaque uh he was there got re recruited for the itf so the itf was both recruiting people that were already living abroad to come under the itf umbrella which was very popular right you're getting these certificates by the guy who made the name taekwondo he still has some power back in korea and uh you get this prestige by being member of this international body and it helps your business grow and whatnot so uh when the itf was established march 26 1966 the need was increasing for instructors to be deployed. So that created a very big problem between the ITF and the KTA, between the former military Taekwondo people and the civilian Taekwondo people, be, be, between the Taekwondo people that were doing general trace patterns and the Taekwondo people that were doing the martial sport. 
there was a lot of things that were problem between them. But guess what? The KTA is the official government governing body in Korea for Taekwondo. So they're the ones that are supposed to be dis dispatching people abroad. And Dong Kun Park, who introduced Taekwondo to Thailand, he was dispatched by the KTA. Uh, he went and learned the ITF patterns uh, to, go, to go abroad because they didn't have the, uh, the uh, Palge forms then and the Taekwondo Pumse. So what you had going on was Requests coming in to deploy instructors because they needed help. And that was not, it, it, you, you took the three-month instructors course that the ITF put on in Seoul. And you trained Taekwondo during the day and at night you had classes in English. Because if you're going abroad, you need to have the international uh, language of business and that's English. So they were taught English at the course at nighttime and trained during the day. When the three months was over, the top graduates would get teaching assignments abroad. Now, were they, were they sponsored? Did somebody pay for their travel expenses by the ITF? I don't know. I kind of doubt that because I don't just don't think the ITF had that money. The kooky one did that later on when it was, you know, a wash in money because it had so much government support, but the ITF didn't have that means to do so. But here's the problem. How was General Choi dispatching instructors? He was doing it through his connections. Where I, where I live, you go in and get a passport. There's no requirement. You're an American citizen. You show you're an American citizen. The only requirement is you fill out the application, you give them a picture, and you pay the money. That's it. But in Korea in those days, they did not issue passports to people. It was just not walk into the passport office and come back when it's done or they mail it to you. It, that's not how it happened. You had to have a reason for going abroad. And what General Choi did through his connections was give them a reason to go abroad. To go abroad, you had to have somebody host you in the host country so you can get a visa, you know, a, a work permission, employment visa, whatever, uh, whatever those, that process entails. And uh, you needed that to be able to justify getting a passport. So General Trade did that all with his connections, personal connections abroad and his personal connections in the government because they were making passports for people who were not KTA, they were ITF. It caused a huge problem. That's one of the reasons why those groups were fighting. So that's the history of how people were being uh, sent abroad. The ITF was doing it, the KTA was doing it. The, the Kukiwan later assumed that um, uh, category and, and the Kukiwan had a lot of money uh, that's why they sent so many people on salary to the African continent. And WTF is a powerhouse. Some of those countries do quite well in competition, but there's virtually no ITF there because there, there never was any uh, financial support to, to, to make that happen. So that's how it started off. And then, of course, once General Choi leaves uh, Korea and escapes to Toronto, Canada to escape political persecution, he moves the ITF there. So he has no base back in Korea. He has no government support at all, and that's 1972. It's eight full years before he goes to introduce Taekwondo to North Korea. And then in 1981, North Korea starts training in uh, Taekwondo, and then they start providing instructors for the ITF to dispatch. And those di instructors were dispatched to the countries where they had diplomatic relations. So their uh, embassy and consulate staff could keep in touch with the instructor and oversee them and, and you know give whatever necessary support and supervision they needed. Uh, and those are the countries, not by coincidence, if you just realize what's going on, those are the countries that South Korea had no diplomatic relations at all, zero, none. Their first diplomatic relations established 
was established with Hungary in the summer 88 Olympics in Seoul. They signed the agreement to establish diplomatic relations with the first communist country during the Olympics. And for those, and I've mentioned this before in a, in a previous lecture, uh, we had already held our world championships in Budapest, Hungary, earlier that year in March and April of, of 88. So we actually hosted a world championships in a communist country. And South Korea finally signed its first agreement to open diplomatic relations. So uh, this, is, this is how uh, the instructors were, were sent abroad by both ITF back in Korea, by KTA, then the Kukiwon and WTF, and then the ITF when they had North Korean instructors. So what it, what it was, because I, I spoke to people who were sent on contract. You went to represent the ITF and somebody there uh, helped you get established and you, you taught. And then, you know, I, I guess you obviously got the certificates from the ITF, but whatever fees you made in the school through your teaching was, was uh, your, you know, your income. So it was, uh, it was pretty much done in the beginning through the, through the, the will, the, the mere force and personality and connections that, that General Che had. And that's another thing that made a lot of problems for him because he used personal connections to circumvent the system in place. And if you're getting circumvented, if you're getting knocked out of the way, and these are really important topics back in Korea, a very poor country at that time, that causes a lot of problems. And some of these problems still are not resolved today with so much resentment. But uh, uh, that really is is how that whole uh, thing happened. And, you know, I asked Master Doug Cook, he does a Ask the Grand Master session on Zoom. And I asked him about, you know, we know so much about ITF and WTF, but we don't know about the independence. We don't know how they got around the world. We don't know how they set up. So uh, Sunduk Sun leaves South Korea and comes to New York. He establishes the World Taekwondo Association. That was a big deal with a lot of member schools all around the country. He had a significant following. June Reed did the same thing. Uh, Young Lee established the ATA, which I believe still is the 100,000 members or something. They even have branches in South America, the, the, the most successful independent Taekwondo organization of the world, in the world. And uh, uh, David Oliver and TAGB, they have an international side, very, very uh, large organization, very successful organization. So there are so many independents out there and we need to compile their stories because their stories are not only important to the students they taught and the communities they served, but they all helped plant the Taekwondo seeds and nourish them and tend to them. So these grew, seeds grew into great fruits, flowers, vegetables. Uh, that, that's the story of Taekwondo. And that's lacking because we only have anecdotal stories and limited things that the Song Mukwan will put on their website and uh, uh, June Ree would have put up on his website and his students do now. Nobody really has drawn them together. Uh, Dr. Kim Hee Young's book does a, 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 a good job in starting that with amassing raw data. As I said, 900 pages of raw data. He focuses on uh, the independence from the, uh, on the United States side because he says the independence as he as one of the ways he defines them is that the independents were martial art and had a sport, but they focused on the personal development, you know, helping the young people learn discipline and helping the adults burn off some stress and, and, and calories and whatnot and, and self-defense and types of things like that. So that's a whole nother um, uh, field to be explored and shared. And for the most part, as I said, 
Junri came over for education, as did Richard Chun and Jack Wong and many others. And, uh, and there were others that went, like, uh, the first one in, in, in Europe that, that I know is Park Sung Jae. I believe he went over there in 1965. So to me, he's the first Korean on the European content, continent teaching. Now, he was ITF member. He was forced, forced by pressure to leave the ITF. He became a very powerful, influential person in the WTF. He actually became acting president when, when Dr. Kim Un Young was arrested and, and carted off and jailed and convicted and, and sent to prison. He was the acting president of WTF. So he's a fascinating man. Why don't we know about him? And it's a shame. So, you know, anybody that studies Taekwondo in Europe, he's probably the first one that, that went there. And uh, he's responsible for Taekwondo in, in, in Italy and Yugoslavia. And General Trey was very smart, co-opted him, and he became part of General Trey's team. And his family told me that uh, the late Grandmaster Park had great admiration for General Trey and was sorry that all the politics happened and, uh, you know, how they suffered because of it. And, and again, that's why Grandmaster Riki Ha goes to Singapore, then because of his connections with the Royal Air Force, uh, gets sponsored to go to the UK. Uh, introduces Taekwondo there and, and, and in Ireland, and look what he's done all around the world. We need to know these stories, I think. I think we need to know these stories. So that's, you know, one of the ways that it, that it happened. And even before it was done officially and they were doing it for Taekwondo, they were doing it for education, and they saw opportunity to make some cash money to help finance their, their living overseas by teaching the martial arts. So. A lot of work needs to be done in that area, but uh, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, okay, the next question is, uh, what was the literal English translation of Odo Kwan and what does it mean to you, Grandmaster Vitali? Okay, so I, I uh, a gem of my way, um, I believe is the literal translation. I'm not sure, sure on that. I, I'd have to look that up. But it's, it was always assumed my, by me incorrectly that it was, this is General Choi's gym, so it's his way. No, no. It was a neutral name, meaning my way, meaning me. I go in the military. Oh, here's the Otakwan. That's my gym. I can go there. If I was with the Chengduquan or Songduquan or Mudaquan, it didn't matter. Now I'm in the military and I can train in this military gym because that's my gym. It's for me. So it was open to all. And uh, that was the reason why it was used. General Che at the time had very close connections with the Chengdu Kwan. Uh, he was honorary director for, for uh, many years. And uh, uh, through his influence there, they started learning his patterns. And that was another bone of contention because when people went in the military, uh, if you were not a member of Odaquan or Chungduquan, you had to be re-examined for your rank and learn these patterns because you weren't doing what they were doing, and that was a that was a big problem. Uh, another, you know, another reason there was friction be between between the groups. The Odaquan was staffed primarily with instructors from the Chengduquan. So the Chengduquan plays a vitally important role in the uh, success of the Odaquan. But that was the translation. And I always thought, oh, General Trey is this very domineering figure, his way to highway, uh, so this, this fits him. No, uh, the, way, the way it's explained is it is literally the gym, it's my gym the gym of my way. Like I can go to this school and train martial arts, regardless if I trained before or if I trained elsewhere before. Uh, because obviously you couldn't, you couldn't just make Chengduquan name like a military um, branch of the Chengduquan because then the other Quans would not feel welcome there. So it was a neutral name and that's why 
uh, it was offered. Uh, uh, General Che uh, was very, very highly educated. If you know anything about calligraphy, in order to, to know the thousands of characters, uh, the picturegrams to write in Chinese, never mind to have the artistic hand, you have to be very well versed in the, Korean, in the Chinese classics. And the Chinese classics means reading this ancient literature that even predates so much in Western civilization. So uh, uh, he used that to come up with the Taekwondo name as well as the Otakwan name. Uh, a lot of Koreans uh, could not read and write Korean. Uh, they certainly couldn't read or write Chinese Hanja. That was for the, for the educated, the very educated actually. And uh, it's uh, something now that they, they really don't do much in Korea. Uh, the, the young people will use the phones to do the translation service uh, uh, to get the root meaning. Because remember, Korean language is an alphabet. It's phonetic based. So it just sounds things out in pronunciation. But to get the underlying meaning, you have to go to the root. English words often have a root in Latin or Greek. Korean words have a root in Chinese hanja, the, the Chinese characters. So when you want to know what a word means, if I wrote Otakwan in Korean, a Korean would read and say, Otakwan, what does that mean? They would have to refer to what uh, the Chinese characters are. It's the same thing with Unam, Unam. I write it in Korean. What's that? Oh, Unam. What does it mean? Oh, I, I don't know. And... Uh, it, some will know, oh, that's the first president of Korea's pen name, his pseudonym. Okay, but what does it mean? Oh, I don't know. But Unam literally means like cloud moving south, which translates the heaven, sent from the heaven to the south. So if you don't know the Chinese, you don't know what Unam means. And if I ask them, what's Unam? Oh, it's, the, it's Sigmund Rhee's pen name, his pseudonym. Well, what does it mean? Oh, I don't know. It's a, so... Uh, that's why the understanding of Chinese is very important. So uh, that's what the Otakwan means. It was a, a neutral way of allowing anybody in the military, because remember, every male, every Korean male uh, that was uh, able-bodied was, was mandatory service in the Korean armed forces. So that was a way to, to make them feel, you know, they can come and train here and, and not be excluded. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is about uh, Taekwondo song that is inside the encyclopedia. Why don't we sing? Oh, I'm not singing it. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the question is why don't we sing it nowadays? Well, first of all, you wouldn't want me to sing it. <laughs> Everybody would drop off this conference fast. Um, I don't know. It was just one of those things that didn't, uh, di didn't really catch on. Uh, don't know. Uh, I would, you know, I would imagine when, when this song was written and appeared in the, in the seventies, uh, for any of you who started training in the seventies, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't join Taekwondo to sing songs. It was all about self-defense. I was a skinny little kid. I was afraid of my own shadow. So it was a way I was going to learn self-defense and have confidence. And, you know, I joined because Billy Jack. I seen Billy Jack in these movies doing this stuff. And I sent to one of my best friends, oh, I wish I could do what that guy did. He goes, why don't you train? I said, I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to begin. He goes, go where I go. I didn't even know he trained. And he said, it was two blocks from my house on top of the Woolworths, uh, you know, like a, a cheap uh, department store that were all over the country. And it was one, two blocks from my house. And my teacher opened the second school in Brooklyn. And it was it was two blocks from my house. I so that's how I joined. So I I certainly I certainly wasn't uh, going to be singing a song. And uh, it would be nice though if somebody uh, uh, you know did the music and we use that as a theme. And if somebody had a good voice and actually uh, sang it, General Choi would like to would sing all the time. And uh, I don't know if he ever sang that song, but. My only guess is it, it just never caught on because it, maybe it was 
just it didn't fit in for the activity at the time. So whoever answered that question, I'd throw it back to you. Get somebody to uh, get the music and get somebody to sing it and uh, put it on YouTube and start to popularize it. Uh, remember, uh, General Trey tasked us all with, with building and developing and, and keep uh, expanding Taekwondo. So that's your job. You have some homework now. But good question. Cute. I like that one. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Apart from his son, did the general's other family members study Taekwondo? I am not aware of his daughter's training. Maybe they did. You know, I'm sure, I, I would imagine maybe they did something in the house. That's a good question. I've met them and never thought to ask them that. That is a good question. Um, they gave fascinating interviews when we had the media. Uh, these people making documentaries in South Korea come to General Trey's 100th uh, memorial, uh, uh, his birthday celebration. We would have been 100 years old. Uh, they interviewed the family extensively. Um, so I, that was a question I, I, I could have asked. I know his granddaughters did. And uh, I would imagine his grandsons did as well because uh, one of his daughters was married to Michael Cormack, who was a, a champion competitor. I think even gold, gold medals in the 78 World Championships, I believe. So... Um, I'm sure, I'm sure his, his children were exposed to it, but as far as his daughters, I don't know. Uh, Grandma Sahan Chak Kyo, who's one of General Choi's favorites, General Choi loved him so much, he wanted him to marry one of his daughters, but I guess his daughter wasn't having any of that, uh, so he actually married one of General Choi's niece. So, um, you know, there was a family connection through marriage, but I don't know if his daughters uh, study Taekwondo, but, but I will tell you this, uh, kind of relate in a very small way, but I think it's fitting. I'll, I'll end the question with this. When, when General Che's widow was interviewed by the Korean media, and I think she made this address to the crowd, she was publicly apologizing to General Choi because she never understood the worldwide impact he had. And she said, you know, there were probably times we, I'm paraphrasing, but we, you know, we missed having him around because he traveled so much. He dedicated his life so much to Taekwondo. And there were probably times in the family, um, you know, might've, might've suffered or been shortchanged for that. But she said, when I am, when I meet him again in the next life, I am going to apologize to him because I should have supported him more. So I think after he passed away and she traveled with the ITF and saw what he built globally, um, that was her reaction. So uh, that just popped into my head and I thought I would end that question with adding that little tidbit in, but yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question is connected with uh, one of our previous sessions. Um, you mentioned that you went on the fifth instructor course and went through everything basics like patterns and so on. Uh, and the question is, what is the difference between the instructor course back then and the grading in that sense? Uh, did you have an assessment of some kind? And if so, can you explain what the assessment was on and how they did it? Okay, so the instructor's course was two weeks long it was 10 or 11 days you know wrapped around two weekends you know usually two weeks monday to friday monday to friday but what they did was wrap the two weeks around two weekends um there was no at the end of the course there was no formal evaluation like a written test for the course itself, but they did present an opportunity to grade at the end of the course, which is customary. Uh, you, you obviously had General Che there, you had uh, 
uh, Master Park Jung Tae, who is the ITF Secretary General and Chairman of the Instruction Committee, who is the Chief Instructor for the course. You had, uh, uh, in my case, uh, Master uh, Charles Seraf, who was uh, the president of the USTF, the national governing body, because that was held in the United States. So the NGB president was there. And you had Master Yu Hong Sung, who was uh, chairman of the ITF promotion committee there. So uh, those that were eligible to test and had permission and whatever the requirements were, were given the opportunity to test. I remember I tested there and I remembered it was much more difficult than the test in my school because we were just not as thorough with the, the, the broad body of knowledge that we were required to learn. And I remember it being very difficult for me because I was not blessed with physical talent. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what God blessed me with because it's certainly not physical talent, certainly not a nice hairdo, and so on and so forth. But uh, I remember being very difficult for me, and I had to, I had to break with the flying turning kick, and I was able to jump, but I honestly don't even know if I did a flying turning kick before being. Uh, introduced to General Che and the ITF a couple years earlier because the, the training in my school was so limited. And I remembered how, what a difficult time I had. And I was kind of hoping, oh, they would just let me slide, but they didn't. And I had to keep doing and keep doing it. And I don't know, it broke eventually. And I just, the only thing I remember was how hard it was and, uh, they wouldn't let me give up, and I didn't, and I broke it. So that's one of the things I remember from the test. And the other thing I remember from the test was we just learned Juche at that um, instructor's course. And I, well, no, sorry, I, I might have, no, I, we didn't just learn it then, but we, this is the first time we had the ITF chief instructor go over it with us. And uh, I'm already testing for fourth degree and for, uh, for the ITF and this is second degree patent. And I said, Oh, they're making us do Juche. And anybody knows that patent, it is just the most awful thing. And we used to do a thing at the end when you do the last technique and you say Juche, and then we come up to the ready posture and we say, amen, because it was over. So the two things I remember from that testing was, we had to do Juche, and I remember it ending and saying, amen, it was over. But somebody happened to take a picture of the two-directional kick of me, and I, it's almost like they superimposed somebody. They said, I actually did that? Because in those days, no digital camera, sport camera was just taken with a regular camera you developed the film later. And I was shocked that I actually did it and it looked pretty decent. So there was no um, evaluation for the course itself. And the other thing I remember was when they actually had a formal, a cute little formal ceremony in, in one of the hotels, one of the rooms in the hotel wh where this, uh, the course was done. And uh, Master Park, the Secretary General, would call all the participants up, and there was someone there that was the oldest, there was someone that was there that was the youngest, and uh, there was a gentleman, Bernard Yagen, a second degree from Germany, who was born with no arms, and General Trey wanted to hand him the certificate, and of course he has no hands to take the certificate because he was born with no arms. So General Trey looked and was a little like, what do I do? And he gave it to him in his mouth, and now, you know, you, you, you take the certificate, then you shake the hand. So there was, so, and General Choi hugged him. And it was just the most memorable thing. How, because uh, General Choi taught him Chung Mu, to do Chung Mu with no arms. So he had him, he adapted using his legs for all of the 30 movements in, in Chung Mu. It was really brilliant. And the certificates that General Choi handed out, and I, I have, Mine is a 
right back up on the wall there. That's it right, right there, hanging up there. Um, he, uh, when he handed out, was before he was started to hand out the certificates, he said, these certificates I took with me when I left Korea, there was hardly anything I could take. Because remember, he just left saying, I'm going to teach Taekwondo. I'll be back when it's over. And, and never came back. Because if they knew he was leaving, they would have never let him leave. So uh, I thought that was fascinating that I have a certificate that General Chase says was from Korea. So uh, the course itself was wonderful. Uh, as I said, two, two full weeks, I, I think it was 10 or 11 days. 11 days, I think I have the date somewhere. And the other day I remembered was uh, General Trey was coming on a Wednesday. And Grandmaster Park said, oh, we have to all go in uh, Dobak to the airport to greet General Trey when he comes. And uh, we, we have to be there. I forget what time the, the plane was arriving. So I said, okay, this is great because we've been there for well over a week already. And we're all sore. We were just pushed to our limits every day. And uh, I said, we're going to be able to sleep in tomorrow. We won't have the morning session. I said, we're getting a break. And then Grandmaster Park said, so too much material to cover. Uh, no time losing. Everybody, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. In the, in the <laughs> So we had to go down to the hall at 6 in the morning. <laughs> but I wish, and I do know that... Uh, uh, some of the ITFs are instituting some kind of evaluation process uh, for, for doing the course. That I think is vital. I also think it's vital that the courses are broken up into modules because you cannot possibly, I do not believe you can certify someone to be an international instructor in a short weekend class. It's just ridiculous. And it also has to, has to involve methods of instruction communicating techniques to students, getting to understand with your words the physical things you're trying to get them to do, which is, uh, is a whole nother type of teaching. So uh, there's a lot that needs to be done with, with that. And my dream was to have an international instructor course at the Taekwondo Wan. And the Taekwondo Wan people asked me, oh, could you do it? I said, uh, of course I can do it, but there are at least a thousand people around the world, if not more, that are much more qualified for me to do it. And I've been trying to get somebody to do it. And now I see, unfortunately, through coronavirus, uh, it was canceled uh, doing one in South Korea. But I believe there is uh, plans to do it uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, so it, it's not... Uh, uh, the, the plan isn't isn't over yet, and, and I don't remember if it was going to be in the Taekwondo Wan, but uh, that, that's the ideal place to do it. To get everybody to come together in this magical place in the mountains it, with nothing around it, to just do Taekwondo is, to me, is a Disney world for, for, you know, for Taekwondo. So international instructor courses were very, very important. They started off at three months, three months duration, and now it's... Uh, not, not much of anything. Uh, I would love to take a instructor's course by the Kukiwan or at least observe it if they didn't let me take it. That is also a, a dream of mine to do. Uh, and, and that uh, is great because it's either at the Kukiwan or the Taekwondo Wan. And the same thing, you network with people and you know everybody stays usually in the same hotel and whatnot. So these, these are great things, but there needs to be there needs to be, in my opinion, uh, an evaluation uh, process after that. So kudos to, to all those that are developing that because, again, uh, that's our mission. That's what we're tasked with with uh, General Trade to do. So I'm glad that we see development on that side. And uh, the only other thing I'll add is I'm the only one I know that's taken uh, official IICs from all three ITFs. I wish more people would do that. I think it's great. But good question. Thank you important question thank you mm, okay so the next question who is the most senior taekwondo person alive today and what influence did they have on taekwondo senior most influential no the senior most taekwondo practitioner in the world today i believe without a doubt 
is Master Grandmaster Kang Su Chong. Grandmaster Kang was uh, uh, he was a very very good friends with Grandmaster Sun Duck Sun. He was one of the first generation students at the Chung Chung Du Kwan under Grandmaster Lee Wang Guk. Grandmaster Kang is senior to Grandmaster Sun because he joined before him. But Grandmaster Sun was older and took over his second Kwan Janim. Uh, when Grandmaster Sun came to the United States, he helped sponsor Grandmaster Kang when he came over here. Grandmaster Kang worked at his school and eventually opened a school in Brooklyn, which is where I'm from, and was the first school in Brooklyn. I said earlier, my teacher opened the second school. Uh, um, he uh, taught military intelligence. Sorry, he taught martial arts to the troops. He was assigned to military intelligence on, under General Choi. Uh, he uh, made his own Quan, an annex Quan of the Chengdu Quan or a breakaway Quan. Uh, I don't know how you want to uh, uh, call it, define it, refer to it as. Uh, that that is still active today. He has three sons that were in the martial arts, my peer group, uh, that he trained, and uh, they are very instrumental at keeping his legacy going. I had the great fortune to be tested for Red Belt. He used to come to our school all the time. Uh, he was he is revered by the Korean pioneers and the Korean grandmasters in in my area. Anybody that knows him loves him. Uh, one, one, wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, I had the great fortune to interview him formally on camera extensively. And uh, I've had the great opportunity, thanks to Grandmaster Kwan Duk Chung, who was one of the pioneers from Argentina, who uh, is very close to Grandmaster Kong and has, uh, through Grandmaster Kwan Duk Chung, has uh, gotten him back involved in the Taekwondo community. He was honored by the U.S. Grandmaster Society in their Hall of Fame. He was inducted uh, in the official Taekwondo Hall of Fame, uh, where we interviewed him, actually. And his contributions are tremendous. He's the uh, obviously the, 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 the most senior person still alive today. He's in his, uh, well into his 80s. Um, he was teaching in the military. He taught on the civilian side with his own school. When he came to the United States, he set up his own school. The ATA, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the biggest independent group in the world, he was the first president of that. And I think it's unfortunate that the ATA's website kind of removes him from history. He was the first president of the ATA. And he was... Uh, one of the instructors of uh, Hei Young Lee, who, who was the, uh, him and his American students were the masterminds behind the, the ATA and, and its success. He also was the president of the American Taekwondo Federation. He was vice president of ITF. And I've never met anybody that said anything bad about him. He used to host a tournament uh, in, in, uh, in New York City that we would go to, General Che actually considered him very, very senior and picked him as a potential successor as president of ITF. As I said, he was vice president of ITF and was forced to leave because of the pressure being put on his family back in Korea by the, the KCIA and whatnot. Um, but he never, he never uh, wavered or, or um, changed his mind about uh, his admiration for General Choi and how much General Choi did for him. So he is the most senior practitioner today, and I think his, his influence is uh, tremendous. I am guessing many people have not heard of him, and it's sad because, again, Un Young Kim, Che Hung Hee, Dr. Kim, General Choi, people know about. And look at all these gems we talk about that um, it's kind of sad, I think, that we don't know more about them. But uh, 
that's I that's I really like that question because it highlights again a void a void in in these great independent people and uh, something I hope is is rectified in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we have a follow-up question. Do you know if Kan uh, uh, Chong is still teaching Taekwondo? No, no, no. He's at an advanced age. He he will come. To, I have seen him at, at some Taekwondo events that he's taken to, but uh, he's at an advanced age. And uh, uh, I am sure that within his group, uh, you know, he gets visitors and maybe does things with, within his group and, and with his sons. So in that aspect, he is, but uh, it's it's not where he, uh, like Grandma Sakimbak Man is very active and he's a few years younger, but is still active actually in the dojang and, and traveling to teach. But Grandma Sakang is a more, ad, uh, more advanced age and um, I don't think is... Uh, I don't think has that uh, that that much of a capacity anymore, uh, and that reminds me, Grandmaster Jack Wong, who was a captain and hosted the second ITF World Championship, was also the head of the U.S. delegation to the first World Championships in Korea, uh, the WTF. So he he was both sides, and 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 very much respected General Choi and as a martial artist, and said it's not fair they're trying to do this to him. So he took upon himself to host that second world championships he was a legend and i always knew about him when i got to meet him and talk with him and eat with him and spend time with him he was already in a wheelchair so you know uh it's a reminder that you know people get old so enjoy them when they're here use them when they're here and when they're gone tell stories about them and 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 uh, keep their teachings with you, pass them on to your students, because in that way you'll keep them alive, in that way you'll honor them. But again, I hate to keep going back to it because it is a, a glaring oversight in uh, the spotlight on some of these iconic people who have uh, uh, not gotten their, their, their fair due. Thank you. Um, okay, we have once more a reference to our last meeting. Um, you mentioned your dissertation on the senior master and senior grandmaster titles about how they don't make sense. And could you go uh, into some more details on that? Um, is it also available to read? And there is also a question connected. Uh, do you know who came up with the title senior master and why was it taken away? Okay, so there's a lot, a lot in there. So uh, if I ask the question, what is Taekwondo? Almost everybody would say it's Korean martial art. Where did Taekwondo come from? Korea. What's the mother language of Taekwondo? Korean. So we need to use Korean titles for a Korean martial art. And as I said earlier, very important to understand, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, alphabet letters in the English language. It's phonetic. I put C, A, T together, I get cat, and I pronounce it cat. I don't know what a cat is. You have to tell me a cat is that thing that's born as a kitten and grows into a cat. It's a furry little thing and has a tail, right? Uh, when you're born and you a child sees a cat, they know, they see the cat, but they don't know what it's called. And then they learn by hearing and then they start pronouncing it. So when it comes to titles, you have to understand that the man who wrote these things as far as ITF Taekwondo goes, was a Korean. He was a highly educated Korean. He was very, very, very knowledgeable about Chinese characters. So, master, I don't know what that means in English, because it means different things. You can be a master tradesman, 
You can be a master over a slave. You can be a master of a martial art because you've trained so long in it, you become proficient, right? Now, a trade. In the old days, a blacksmith, right? Nobody went to the blacksmith and said, can I see your certificate hanging on the wall that shows you're a master? How did they know that they were a master? How? Very simple. The quality of their work. They studied, not at blacksmith school, because they didn't have it. They studied under a master blacksmith. They were an apprentice. At some point, they had the ability to go on their own and start getting their own customers. And at some point, somebody would say, oh, go down there and see John. He's a master blacksmith. So master has different meanings in the English language. Forget about that. It, it doesn't mean anything in, in Taekwondo because Taekwondo is what? Korean martial art. And uh, we don't use master in Taekwondo, in Korean. There is, as far as I know, there is no way to translate what is no Korean word for master. It's instructor. Sabum means instructor. Sabum has nothing to do with rank. Sabum means instructor. What kind of instructor? Sa means the teacher. The boom side means somebody to model yourself after. Somebody that's showing you, you something that you can follow, right? Has nothing to do with rank. People confuse rank and belts and black belt don with a title. Has nothing to do with that. Think merely about what these words mean. Sa is teacher. Boom is the kind of teacher you model yourself after. In other words, as Dr. Sanko Lewis, read what he wrote about this. If you can't find it, email me and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it to you. I'll also get you, I think it was a four or five page article I wrote. It was published in Totally TKD Magazine. I can uh, email that to you as well. That explains uh, the shoulder flashes and, and whatnot. So, if you understand that sabum means nothing but instructor, an instructor, a teacher to model yourself after, then you can, from there, know what busabam means. Busabam means assistant, vice, deputy, right? So it's a, an assistant instructor. Very simple. Very simple. So what is sahyang? If you think sahyang means master, you're wrong. It does not mean master. It means teacher. What kind of teacher? Sa means teacher. Hyung is not boom, right? It's written differently in English. It's written differently in Korean. It sounds differently in English. It sounds differently in Korean. So guess what? It's different. So Sa Hyung means a wise and benevolent teacher. It means a teacher who is responsible for teaching the non-physical. So you can't look at the motions and model yourself off this person. This is beyond the physical. This is somebody that's teaching you the spirit, the dough, if you will. So it means a wise and benevolent teacher. What does sasang mean? It does not mean grandmaster. Sasang means teacher. What kind of teacher? A saintly sage, a, a very, like a sage, right? Somebody that we will look back upon and we will learn from their life example. That's what sasang means. It is a very high honor to be awarded that title. It has nothing to do with master and have nothing to do with grandmaster. On the WTF side, because they did not have General Che as a teacher, they have Sabum. 
Sabo Nim, right? Nim is the honorific. Instruct a sir, instruct a man. So they have the same exact sabam, the same exact sabanim, the same exact Korean writing, the same exact underlying um, Chinese characters that say what it means. To give the, the Korean phonetic alphabet the meaning, the root meaning. Same as we do. Nothing's different. What do they use on top of that? They use Kwan Jai Nim. What is Kwan Jai Nim? It means owner, boss, director, head. So it doesn't mean grandmaster. There is no term that I know of told to me by Koreans for a term for, for, that equates to master. So forget about all that. So if you understand Sabam instructor, Busabam, assistant instructor, deputy vice instructor, right? Somebody underneath an instructor, helping instructor to instruct the physical part. Sahyung, a wise and benevolent teacher, right? So I already, I already was an assistant instructor. I already was an instructor. And what was I doing? Focusing on teaching the color belts, right? Again, if you go to the to General Trace teachings, you'll see. What, what can it, who can a first degree black belt teach as, as an assistant instructor? Up to what cup level? Who can a second degree teach? Up to what cup level? Who can a third degree teach? Up to what cup level? What did I say three times? Gup level. So an assistant instructor can teach color, uh, color belts. That's why they have the shoulder flash, the instructor shoulder flash with the white stripe because they are authorized to teach color belts. And they don't put this on just because they're first, second, or third degree black belt. They put it on because an instructor authorized them, deputized them, commissioned them, appointed them to assist in instructing. Or they took an instructor's course, a domestic instructor's course, and they passed it, and they've been certified a national instructor, domestic instructor, or whatever. So it has nothing to do with belt rank. It, it has to do with the way you refer to a teacher and what that type of teacher is. Now you pass over to fourth degree. You get the uh, pipings down the sleeves and you, of your legs and arms, and you get the title sabam, sabanim, instructor. They put on the additional black, the additional stripe, and then now it's black. Why? Because you are responsible for teaching color belts and black belts, right? That's what the responsibility of an instructor is. The physical part of Taekwondo, you are instructing in. You now keep advancing. What happens when you advance? Your hair falls out, right? You get older. You slow down. You lose flexibility. There are so many things that happen in the aging process. We even shrink. Our height actually shrinks as we age. What also happens if you are a person eager to learn, you gain experience. Experience, ladies and gentlemen, is not gained just by getting old. It's gained by what you do along the process of getting old. That's why being promoted in the testing guidelines under his teachings shows hours for color belts. Why? You are learning basics. You are learning physical movements. I can teach somebody that's very talented the 19 moves of Chunji, and they can walk away in one lesson knowing the 19 movements. I also can teach somebody in a first lesson how to do side piercing kick. And I think you all have this experience when you get a real hot shot a super talented person come in. You look and say, wow. And you know you can teach that person to do a flying sidekick in one lesson. You, you definitely can. Why? Because they are talented. So physical attributes is not up to me as an instructor. It's not up to you as a student. It's up to whoever you look at as your creator, be it nature or as I do God. We all are born with innate abilities and natural talents. A good teacher, 
a good instructor, a good parent who nurture and develop and fine tune these things. What is a teacher? A parent is a teacher, the first teacher. What is a teacher in, in, in the Orient? A teacher is on par with the parent. As General Choi would write, the, the Chinese saying, treat the teacher, father, and king equally. Why? Why? Nobody loves the children like the parent. A teacher, like a parent, has the best interest in the child. So when you teach your children, when you raise your children, even when you discipline your children, you are hoping to raise them to be sufficient, sustainable adults to stand on their own and be successful. You have their interests at heart. You are doing things for them that they do not, not, might not yet know is good for them. The same with the teacher. I am not a father. I am not, I've not had the challenge of being a parent. It's my only regret in life. But why am I not a father? Because I don't have a child. I am only a teacher because I have students. Take away the student, I am no longer a teacher by mere definition. By mere definition, I no longer am a teacher if you take away the student. What does that translate to? That translates to the student is more important than the teacher. When there's no food to go around, who suffers, the parent or the child? The parent will give the children the food before they eat. We know that. We know that. It's innate. We know that. It's naturally occurring. So in, a, in the Orient, they look at parent and teacher as on the same level. Why? Because they both have interests of the student. Now, parent, teacher, king on the same level. Why? In this philosophy, the king must be benevolent. So a benevolent ruler doesn't care about the jewels and all the trimmings for them and their palace. They care about their people. Their responsibility is to tend to, to take care of, to look after their people. So that's why treat the teacher, parent, and king equally. So getting back to the Taekwondo terminology for instructor. Instructor, very simple. Assistant instructor underneath, very simple. Sa Hyung, that benevolent teacher, that wise teacher. You ever notice why there's not hours for training time in the dance levels? Because it's no longer about technique. It's about polishing the techniques. And of course, you're developing more techniques and you're learning new techniques. But that's done over a period of time. And it's not true to say there's no test for seventh degree. There is an evaluation for seventh degree. It's just not physical. They're evaluating, or they should be evaluating, the attributes you have to be a wise and benevolent teacher. That's what the focus should be on. So if you pass over the threshold of seventh degree and you are now called a master, so to speak, in the English language, that, that is the elite, right? The elite. Those who fully understand all aspects of Taekwondo, the physical and the non-physical, the physical and the mental, the physical and the spiritual. That's why the red is there. Red is the color of spirit. When you get excited, when you get embarrassed, when you get flustered, your face gets flushed with red, right? Red is the spirit, the color of spirit that signifies spirit. So you put the red on the shoulder flash because you are now responsible for the dough. The non-physical, the, the, the mental side, so to speak, the non-physical side of Taekwondo. That's why you have a different title. 
as you go further and further along and that time keeps ticking and the sun goes up and the sun goes down and it goes up and the time passes and more hair falls out and the hair you have left turns gray and so on. We are hoping you're learning more experience. So anybody that does ITF Taekwondo and you recite the student note, how does it end? I shall build a more peaceful world. So you pledge to do these things. You recite the tenets of Taekwondo. And the last thing you're pledging is to build a more peaceful world. Why? The goal of Taekwondo is to build a more peaceful world. How? By creating strong physical students with good moral character that are able to stand on the side of justice at all times. Isn't that great I made that up? No, I didn't make it up. I'm reciting it almost verbatim from the books. If you read this stuff, it's all there. This is not a secret. It's all written in English, in Russian, in German, in Spanish. I forget, I lost track. I think we're up to 12 languages, including Darcy from Afghan, the language. General Trey's teachings have been translated into. I don't know any other martial art that can boast that. I don't know any. 14, I think, I'm losing track. 14 languages his, his texts have been translated into. So, none of this is a secret. It's all there. That's why... Promoting somebody as a color belt can be done very rapidly if they put the extra hours in and what? They grasp the physical techniques. So General Choi would say, learning the basics as a color belt is akin to learning the letters of the alphabet. That's all it is. It's a basic elementary instruction in the alphabet. Then you put the words together and the words in sentences and the sentences in paragraphs, before you know it, you're telling your story. You wrote your own story that you can read and others can read. That's what Taekwondo is. It is a way to a better life. So the goal of Taekwondo is to build a more peaceful world by making strong physical students of solid moral character. So it's done on the micro and the macro. I now because of my parents, my religion, my academic education, and my Taekwondo, I'm a better person morally, which means I'm a better person in my community. And I'm teaching that. I've been involved in that in 46 years of Taekwondo, 47, I lose track. And that grows on a micro level. I even took my career in that area of law enforcement. So I would be able to stand on the side of justice and have a, a, a big team behind me. So that's what Taekwondo is about, according to the man who documented all this and first called it Taekwondo. So the tenets of Taekwondo, he did not make up. He just took them out of where they always were in society. Those five tenants were in the East, they were in the West, they were everywhere in between. What parent doesn't want their child to be courteous? What employer doesn't want to hire courteous workers? Who does not want to have a courteous neighbor? <laughs> Who doesn't want to date a courteous person? Uh, come on, what teacher in the academic setting doesn't want courteous students in there that are gonna perceive and work hard and control themselves? And have the courage to stand up for things when it's not easy to stand up for. So if you understand what Taekwondo is and you understand where it comes from and the teachings of the man who formulated it, you'll understand his titles. So I hope now you understand. Instructor, Sabam. Bu Sabam, assistant instructor. Sa Hyung, wise and benevolent instructor, teacher. Sasung, a saintly sage teacher. As General Choi would say, teach with your body when young, your words when older, 
and your moral precept after you're gone. So a true sasang will teach by their example. Uh, I don't know who your instructor was. I don't know what group you belong to, but I guarantee you that if your instructor, if your president, if your head of your organization has gone to the next place, I guarantee in some way you are still learning from that person's example. So that's what the words mean. I'm happy to send the article I wrote about the flashes and how the colors make no sense because I explain what the, those colors mean, right? They have nothing to do with the color belt system, nothing to do with it at all. So if you understand what the colors mean, because that means you understand what the words mean. So seventh and eighth degree is Sa Hyung, wise and benevolent teacher. Can you be a senior wise and benevolent teacher? Can you? It's not logical. Do you understand? Can you be a senior saintly person, a senior grandmaster? Can you? It makes no sense. From a pure definitional standpoint, the verbiage. But no, if you look at it from the English language, you're tricked. You're cheated, actually. Why? Because you don't know the depth of it. I don't know how many people know what I just said. I don't know if, if they've ever heard that before. So there is no such thing as senior master. There is no such thing as senior grandmaster. So they floated in one ITF with the headquarters in Vienna, Austria, uh, several years ago. And... Um, they were taken out. I was the only one that opposed it. I stood up in Congress and I raised my hand and I give my spiel and they just went forward and uh, did what they did. And the way it was explained to me, it was a kind of like an informal thing and it doesn't mean any harm. And I didn't let it go. I kept pursuing it, pursuing it, pursuing it. And one of the first things the new president did when he came in, because I, I think I might have gotten into this at one of the questions before. At an executive board meeting, I brought it up and I asked for it to place on the agenda for the next executive board meeting, which I which it was. So now old business, uh, they come any new business that I say, here's my new business, I want to brought it up to the, you know, uh, put it on the agenda for next time. Next time come up, I said, okay, what's on the agenda here? One of the first things they did was address the thing about senior master and senior grandmaster. And the new president said, this is ridiculous. It makes no sense. And uh, how can there be a senior grandmaster? Anybody senior to General Che? It's ridiculous and insulting, blah, blah, blah. And it was removed. So the fact that some people use it, that's their personal thing. I know of no, none of the ITFs that uh, embrace it officially. And I do know uh, the USTF uses senior grandmaster for the case of Grandmaster Seraph, not because there's two Grandmaster Seraphs. It's because Grandmaster Charles Seraph is the titular head of that organization. So they give him the extra honor of referring to him as senior grandmaster. And that the way it used to be traditionally, there was only one ninth degree in the system and you could not be ninth degree. Grandmaster C.K. Troy would never accept ninth degree. He was promoted when Grandmaster Riki Ha was promoted to eighth degree. He's actually senior Grandmaster Riki Ha. And he refused to be ninth degree while his teacher, General Choi, was alive. Many of the others refused to do the same thing. Grandmaster Riki Ha and Grandmaster Charles Seraph and Grandmaster Kwang Sung Wong, they were among the first three in 1997 that were promoted. They all refused. And General Choi said, that's a fine, that's honorable. I love that. I appreciate that, but we will just refer to me not as grandmaster, but as a founder or president. And it was a way to open that door up so he could promote grandmaster Reed to the first ninth degree. So uh, I, I don't think anybody should use the title of senior grandmaster because it, I think it's, it's ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense, but I, I kind of think it's, it's uh, 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 disrespectful as well. 
so I was glad it was removed Im immediately and uh, with, with no resistance. So if people still use it, that's a personal thing. That's fine. Uh, just understand it makes no sense. And uh, if you are a seventh degree and need a special title when you become eighth degree, I think if you need it, and if you need to put a new color, that means nothing. It has nothing to do with the color scheme. What does green mean? And in my article I wrote, is green envy? Because that's the, right? Green is envy, the color of envy. You want, you know, you're envious. You want a new title that somehow is going to pacify you like a baby. I say, if you use the term senior master, and I'm being very provocative on purpose now, because I want people to think, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but if you use that, you might want to consider that you are not a wise and benevolent teacher. Maybe you shouldn't have been a seventh degree to begin with. So if you understand these underlying meanings, then I think you might have some more insight and in why uh, I think it was a, a, a really ser uh, not serious mistake. It's not a serious mistake. It's, it's an unwise mistake. It's, kind of like a mistake you make when you're not informed. So uh, kind of silly to me. So, you know, that's how it all surfaced. And I don't know if it was back in 2007 or 2008. I, I don't remember. But, you know, I think it was done innocently. I think it was done to reward people. Um, I, and I certainly don't think anything wrong with that. But I always say, as General Choi did, change is good. Change is inevitable. But change must come with thinking. Are we changing for the good? What we're changing, does it make sense? Why are we changing? And, and if, you, if you have change without contemplation, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's uh, uh, helpful and, and, and it could be, uh, counterproductive. So I was very glad that it was removed. And uh, if you Google Dr. Sanko Lewis, he has a blog. It's, it's the things he's written on his blog. If you don't know who he is, he's a South African, so his English is impeccable. He's moved to South Korea. He's lived there for a very long time. He's now learning Korean. He has a PhD from a Korean university. One of the only two to get an uh, uh, only two IT practitioners in the world to get a PhD from South Korea him and, and, and Dr. John Johnson. They are fascinating what they write in their blogs. They are real thinkers. They are uh, educated academics and real martial artists. So they can really help you with these kind of concepts that's not about kicking and punching. So if you read uh, about the things they've written about philosophy and the terminology, uh, most of what I got to just balk this all out has come from what they taught me. So I, I, I can't recommend uh, enough re reading the things that they put up there. They're, they're, they're uh, really brilliant. But um, I get that question a lot and there's a lot of confusion. So I'm happy to readdress it uh, again. So uh, I, I appreciate that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, you talked earlier about uh, Taekwondo uh, taking its techniques from many different styles and martial arts. And the question is, can we clearly say uh, where the kicking techniques came from? Yes, yes, I think you, you definitely can think, uh, can, uh, it came from the innovation of these Korean pioneer grandmasters. I remember, So I, I joined an ITF school in 1974, but we were really a Korean karate school that were doing ITF patterns, karate style. And we were ITF main gymnasium number 21. The plaque is hanging somewhere over there. Um, we got ITF certificates when we were tested because my teacher would send the, the money into the ITF. And we had these really nice certificates. And he said, wow, he, he used to tell me having a certificate 
black belt certificate signed by General Che was like having an invitation to come to America by Christopher Columbus. He says, it doesn't get better than that. And I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't know anything about him. My teacher encouraged me to read his books because he said, no Korean ever wrote things like this. Your English is good. My English is no good. Read the shares with the students. So that's how I started getting exposed to this. But when I found a love for teaching and sharing, I didn't do a good sidekick, but I got my students to do a double sidekick and a triple sidekick, quadruple sidekick. And, you know, I'd get them to stand against the wall and they would lean against the wall and they'd just keep kicking sidekick, you know, with that chamber back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, I just did this from what I saw in my school and using my own, you know, oh, if they leaning on the wall, they have better balance. So it was just my own brain putting these things together that I absorbed in my, in my own teaching. That's all. Uh, none of this is uh, um, uh, uh, trade secrets or rocket science. I'm sure no matter where you are in the world, you've had these kind of, uh, uh, you know, experiences yourself and, and, and coming to these realizations on your own. Sometimes you might have saw it in a book, in a movie or whatever. So I was very limited in, in what I did until 1984 when I met General Trey the first time. It was at an ITF tournament. In, in, it was a General Chase Cup in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Uh, Grandmaster Suk Chung Kim hosted it, and I was like so amazed. And when I took my first seminar with him, it was in Houston, Texas, and I came back. Everybody asked me because in my school I was a know it all, right? And they said, What you learn? And I said, I learned I don't know nothing about Taekwondo. And they said, What are you talking about? And I never was with somebody training under like him. When he was asked the question, and he answered the question, I would say, duh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I realize that? His answers were so thorough, my jaw would drop. I'm like, we never had any of that. My teacher would grunt out directions. His English was limited, and he's a very smart man. And I learned so much from him. But the teaching was very rudimentary, and the instruction was very limited because of the language gap. So. Uh, where did these techniques come from? Well, when you're training and you're looking to develop new things and put a system together, General Wu Jung Lim, who was C.K. Choi's teacher and uh, Kong Yong Il's teacher, and uh, Park Chung Su was under him as well, uh, they say he came up with reverse turning kick. Why? He was looking to score ways to score points in a in a fight, right? So. Uh, Park Jung Su told me uh, the story of uh, he was living in General Che's house and uh, he was a young uh, young man at the time and uh, General Che would hardly ever sleep and he's in his room trying to sleep. General Che banging his way, Jung Su, yes sir, and he just snapped to attention and come out and it would go all night long with trying to come up with a word for this what some would call a spinning back kick. And they finally figured out, okay, when you're in an L stance and you turn and kick this way, you're doing a turning kick. So if you turn this way and kick with the uh, back heel, you are also turning, but you're turning in the opposite direction. You're turning in the reverse direction. So Dora Chage and Bande Dora Chage. Reverse turning kick. That's how they named it. So where did it come from? It came from General Wu. Now, did he actually come up with it? I have no idea. It could have, you know, like fire. It could have been uh, uh, conceived all different places from all different people. He was from the Chungdukwan. Did uh, uh, Gramasa Sunduk Sun teach him? Did Nam, Nam Tehi teach him? Uh, Am Yong Gu? You know, we don't know these things, but we know that in the ITF curriculum, this is the man who was credited with it, and that's how the 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 term was was applied to it. And this was repeated all the time. I, I told you about the uh Batoro Chagi, the twisting kick. That's like I never when I learned Gay Beck, I didn't learn it as a twisting kick. My teacher said do a a 45 degree angle front kick. So now I don't know, maybe my teacher didn't know what Batoro Chagi was. I have no idea. So when I first learned that technique, I said, you got to be kidding me. But those of you who can do it good, it's a deadly kick. 
And it's a kick that's never utilized. Now, where did that come from? I think that came from General Trey's mind. But also, Grandmaster Wang Ki had the same kick. So did he get it from him? Did he see it in one of his books? Did he see it in another book? I have, I have no idea. Uh, so a lot of these things, we, we, can't, we can't definitively label or assign an actual person that did it. The, you know, the patterns we can and some other, other things like uh, uh, rules and whatnot. But uh, General Trey obviously didn't create the five tenants. He just listed them. And, he's, and then he assigned these are the, the tenants of Taekwondo. Anybody else could have did that because he didn't come up with the concept of courtesy. He didn't make the name courtesy. So um, th the kicks came from the Koreans because of innovation. They needed to find a way to score points. Because remember, they were focusing on a sport angle. And they wanted this sport to be primarily legs. So when you have rules, rules determine strategy. Strategy makes you think to be more strategic. Also, karate was what? So many hands. You can look at the early books of karate by Funakoshi, and then there's a, a, a great one in 1960. I forget the author's name. I have it on my shelf. I think Brown. Uh, Hideshaki uh, Clark, I, I forget, it's right there, I can't read it from here, but uh, uh, that book, if you look at that book, the 1960 book, it is almost, the 1965 book of General Che is almost a direct copy of that. I mean a direct copy, put it on the Xerox machine and make a copy. I'm talking plagiarism, I'm talking almost direct copy. Now it's not a direct copy because there's a lot of things in there that are not there. But you can't help even the way the photos are, are, are laid out. So I have no idea if that was a common printing thing back then. I, I have no clue. But um, when you look at those two books side by side, you like say, oh my God. Now, one of the saving things is General Che wrote a book in 1959 that had a lot of this stuff in there already. So did he actually copy it from this book? Did they both copy it from Funakoshi? I have no idea. But all of these things were done on purpose. And if you look, and I've done it myself, and I know other people have done it uh, much more thoroughly than I did. They actually look at the manuals and they count the number of kicks and they label the kicks and they show the, the evolution of how Taekwondo added kicks that karate never had. Why? They wanted to be different, and they needed to use the innovation to create more ways to score because they needed this new sport to be popular because their goal was to make it an Olympic sport. First, a na their national sport, then internationalize it with hope of getting in the Olympics. They were brilliant. Obviously, we know how successful they were, so it worked. We know it. So that's where these kicks came from. Uh, when you look at people like Han Chuck Kyo was a great jumper. He's the one on the plaque doing the flying high kick. That picture is in the 65 book. It's also in the 72 book. As a matter of fact, all the pictures that were used for the artist renditioning the, uh, all came from the 1972 first edition. So um, uh, he was a great jumper. And uh, I am sure that he looked to do things in the air that he did on the ground because he could get up in the air and stay in the air. Again, innovation, experimentation. This is not, um, this is not hard to figure out if we think. Unfortunately, we don't have video of them actually doing it, you know, like to be in the laboratory, so to speak, to be in the barracks or, or, or the training field, uh, you know, where, where these things are actually playing out in real time. But, through the stories, that's, you know, that's how it was, uh, um, it was done back then. And the second generation, you know, they were rejecting some of the, the staid uh, traditional restrictions that the first generation leaders like General Che and Lee Wong Guk and Wang Qi and, and so had. Uh, and they were looking to experiment, right? 
doesn't the, the subsequent generations always look to, 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 to branch out and push the limits, so to speak? So that's where I believe those, uh, it's obvious those uh, kicking techniques came from. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a broad question for you. Uh, would you tell something about the history of Taekwondo in Malaysia? For example, patterns created there the second home of Taekwondo, the generation of instructors, students involved such grandmasters as uh, Lo Kun Lin or Sabri. Uh, could you say something about that? Sure. Okay, so Malaysia, General Choi called the second home of Taekwondo. Why? He lived there as ambassador on official assignment. So uh, detractors that look to attack uh, uh, almost anything and everything that General Choi did somehow try to poo poo that these taekwondo patterns he developed are not really korean because he developed them in malaysia well i think that's silly uh anybody that knows anything about embassies an embassy is official soil of korea the korean embassy in malaysia kuala lumpur is official sovereign territory of korea so uh that's not just korea that's every embassy around the world we all know about diplomatic community and we know about diplomatic passports i'm in new york city we don't let people into the united states from certain countries but you know what people on diplomatic passports coming to the to the un in new york city on un business they are allowed into this country and have a 25 mile radius to conduct un business and we cannot stop them. so that is the united nations has their own uh, police department their own security force it's it's uh, its own separate being. It's just located in New York City. It's also located in Switzerland. So uh, General Choi goes to Malaysia uh, towards the end of uh, 62, and he establishes the uh, Korean embassy there. Uh, while he's there, uh, he comes up with the idea, how do I promote Korea? How do I promote Korea? I am the Korean ambassador. Embassies have the role of promoting their home country. They usually have cultural affairs uh, people assigned there. And um, they network with local groups and do all kinds of things. When uh, the ITF hosted the World Championship in Ireland, I went to the Korean embassy in Dublin. I tried to get them to uh, sponsor and support and set up a table, but it, it was terrible because the politics interfered with that as well. Because when the uh, uh, cultural attache that was there Loved the idea. This is great. I can't believe this is happening. She was all gung ho. I met with her at the embassy it, it itself. And then all of a sudden, she checked with her superiors and they came back. This is ITF Taekwondo. This is not Olympic Taekwondo. It's not the Taekwondo from South Korea. It's Communist Taekwondo from North Korea. So they had no involvement at all. It was awful because I went to the, in Dublin, there is a, uh, uh, several Korean restaurants. There are several, a significant group of young Koreans that go there for education system because the education system is very good. And what? It's in English. So uh, they have a, uh, a, a Korean expatriate community. I know one of the leaders there. She has a restaurant right uh, 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 up Apano Street, right behind the uh, the statue there. And every time over, I'm always in there and always eating with her. A lot of times she doesn't even charge me. They're all gung-ho for this because they think this is great. And it got poo-pooed because of uh, politics. Uh, quite, quite unfortunate. But the point is that General Trey goes over to Korea, uh, 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 gets pushed out of the army and, and sent to Malaysia as ambassador because Park Ching he wanted to solidify his control. He did not trust the senior officers that outranked him. Uh, as you know, or you should know, General Che was on the uh, tr military tribunal that convicted Park Jung-hee for uh, being a communist traitor and a communist, uh, a communist traitor and a Japanese collaborator. So uh, needless to say, Park Jung-hee had no love for General Che. Plus, General Che was... Uh, uh, had another strike against him. He was from the physical part of North Korea. 
even though Korea was unified under Japanese rule, colonial rule at the time, but the military generals that were originally from North Korea were not fully trusted because they were perceived to maybe have dual allegiances because family and their roots were ever from there. And the third thing was he was not a member of the eighth military class. The eighth military class was the, the, the uh, support system made up of young colonels that resented the generals above them because these generals came up the rank really fast. Once they got there, there's nowhere to go. So they stayed there, which meant, means log jam. The young colonels can't get promoted because the generals aren't going anywhere. So they were the ones that uh, were instrumental in the coup. Uh, uh, Colonel uh, Kim Jong-pil, who is the mastermind behind the, the, the actual military coup, uh, was a member of the 8th Academy class. General Choi obviously was the first Academy class. Park Jung, he was the second. So uh, all of this dynamics is going on. And to solidify the rule and to get rid of all the dissenters, people were disappeared, people were thrown in jail, people were told to exile, and people were marginalized all different ways. Some of them, like General Choi Hung Hee and Choi, Choi, General Choi Duk Chin, were sent abroad as ambassadors. So now they're out of the country. And when they're out of the country, they set up this embassy. So he's looking and saying, how can I promote Korea's image? Because remember, nobody knows what Korea is. For half a century, it was dominated by Japan. In the Olympics in 36, two Koreans placed first and second in the marathon. Oh, first and second or first and third, I forget. But, but they, they won the gold medal, and they either won a silver or a bronze. And... Guess whose flag was raised? Not Korea's flag. The rising sun of Japan. So you have to understand how much hatred there was and how much resentment. And now nobody knows what Korea is. It's a very poor country. They don't really have anything to promote themselves. So General Choi, award-winning calligraphy artist, says, oh, Malaysia. Malaysia is packed with who? Ethnic Chinese. What is General Choi? Award-winning calligraphy. So he writes, he does a whole bunch of calligraphy, and he, he announces in the press that at the Korean embassy, there will be a calligraphy display. So the press comes to cover the event, People are looking, they see all the things, you know, like honor, uh, father, teacher, king is one, right? All these things that are written, these great Chinese classical axioms, tidbits of wisdom, and they're all, oh, this is great. Now they come down and they see in Chinese written, Taekwondo, and they're looking and saying, Taekwondo, what is that? So General Trey says, oh, that's the Korean martial art. So what do you mean martial art? We have martial art here in Malaysia. He says, yeah, yeah, this is the Korean one. What is it? So this now gets written up in the paper. And a young man named Lao Kun Lin was a, 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 was a black belt in judo at the time. See, reads this in the paper. And he calls up the embassy. <laughs> General Choi gets on the phone and goes, hey, I seen Korean martial art. I like to learn it. I'm, I'm a black belt in judo. It's all come down. He come down the embassy. So now, Lao Kulun comes down to the embassy, and the embassy is actually the first dojang in Malaysia teaching Taekwondo. Maybe the first one in the world, because remember, people around the world teaching, but they're not teaching under the Taekwondo name. So this literally could be, the embassy could be the first Taekwondo dojang uh, in the world. Uh, probably in Vietnam it was, because they were teaching there already, but certainly in Malaysia. So he starts teaching him in this... Um, in the embassy. And uh, I interviewed Lao Kulin, wonderful man, uh, at his house in, in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, with his family, and they would tell, and his students, they would tell the story, you know, he'd get on his motorcycle and go there, and it extended his day, because now he's going to go to the embassy and train in Taekwondo. So he's the first student of Taekwondo in Malaysia. So now General Trey says, this is catching on. I need people to teach. And that's when he summons a retired lieutenant, Wu Jae Lim, and a retired sergeant, 
Master Sergeant Kim Bakman. So they come, where do they live? They live in the, the Korean ambassador's residence. They live in the official residence where General Choi did, and they shared a room. So General Choi had his ma manuscript with the patterns already written out. Now, I believe by this time, there's already Warong, Chungmu, Ulji, Samil, Unam, Gebek, and Tongil is already uh, done. Uh, and he's got his manuscript, and I don't know how many's in the manuscript. Nobody knows. People assume it's 16 because they, they know of the first four that were in print, and they also know about uh, the 65 book that had 20 in it. So they do the math. 20 minus 4 is 16. So it's a myth that 16 patterns were developed there. Nobody knows how many would develop there because General Trey had his manuscript. His manuscript he's been working on since 1955. So nobody knew how many were actually written out before he got there. Nobody knew if it was 16, if it was 20, if it was 24. No, nobody knows. But the assumption is it's 16. That number can't be right because I already know Han Chak Kyo was working on Tong Il back in Korea with General Che prior to this. We know Tong Il has two versions, right? Uh, and we know that uh, uh, Grandma Sa Kim has told me about how they would put the ABCD on the wall of their room. Uh, so when they were trying to work through the movements, they knew which way to turn and whatnot. So uh, we know several of them were worked on there. They were fine-tuned and polished. Were they completed? I don't know. What do you mean by completed? All 24 could have been completed. But the, um, the definition of completing that most people use is the 1965 book that's got 20 patterns in it. Well, guess what? That book was completed in Korea. Grandma Sa Kim Bok Man, he has a really strong, I don't want to say brain, he has a really strong memory. He has a wonderful brain, and he has a very strong memory. And uh, he would say, like General Choi would call him up and say, no, 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 uh, ask him something, and he would say, uh, check page 93 or something, you know? I mean, so he literally uh, uh, put the book together. And who who wrote the book is General Che because of his English, and, and Grandma Sir Kim told me that, plus the embassy staff. The embassy staff he utilized, they're supposed to be doing you know, Korean government work and doing Taekwondo work, which he got in trouble for. But, uh, so completed means to me, the book was completed and it was completed in Korea. But General Choi says it wasn't completed because they ran out of time and only can, could, could include 20 patterns. What does that mean? It means what it means. There was more than 20 patterns ready to go, but they ran out of time to print the book. Why did they run out of time? In the fall of 1965, General Choi got sponsorship by the Korean government to travel around the world to introduce Taekwondo, to do a series of demonstrations in Cairo, in Italy, in France. I mean, they went all over the place, starting in Malaysia, by the way. Well, finishing Malaysia, I forget what leg of the journey. But this all is going on in Malaysia, but now they're back in, in Korea. So for, for any of you who have written a book, you know that you have to lay out the templates of formats. And in those days, I guess it was actual printing press. A lot of things are done by computer now. I, you know, I, I really have no idea. That's not my uh, area of uh, expertise. But they needed to take the pictures, have the foot. Uh, uh, things placed in there and the, the arrows with the dotted lines and the diagram and the text and whatnot. And they simply ran out of time. So in the manuscript in Malaysia, did he write it there? Did he bring it there? Did he finish it there? 
All we know is the book was completed in Korea and it, they only had time to put in 20 patterns. So uh, forget about 16, throw it out the window. This was something I floated as I was thinking out loud with people around the world and on the internet in trying to piece together what was going on. So please don't say there were 16 patterns developed on Mal in Malaysia. Nobody knows that. It's, it's, it's not based on anything that's solid. It was a, a parameter we threw out there to get some kind of framework, uh, some sign of starting point from what we were doing. So Malaysia became very, very important. Uh, these two gentlemen came over, and the Malaysians can tell you, uh, uh, Malaysia is a powerhouse in ITF Taekwondo. They were the first two there. Uh, the next two that came, I mentioned earlier, was C.K. Choi and Riki Ha. Uh, it's funny, I, I interviewed the person who paid for their boat ticket. They're coming over by boat. General Choi leaves by plane, so they never see each other. They get there, and they're supposed to, General Choi's supposed to, re, somebody's supposed to reimburse uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lee sang for the tickets. <laughs> He's still waiting. And I think it was 2010, I interviewed him. He's still waiting for General Choi to pay him back. So uh, good luck with that. But Malaysia is very important because this is where uh, uh, the Malaysian Taekwondo Association was established in July 1963. And this is key. Why? In Korea, as I mentioned before, it's a Korean Taekwondo Association. So Malaysia actually has a Taekwondo Association and the civilians in Korea don't. So very, very important Malaysia. Uh, they hosted the world championships there in 1994. They were supposed to host it there in 1986. And the South Korean government interfered and pressured them. So it, the, uh, Malaysia wasn't allowed to host it. And we had to wait till 87. And, and Greece stepped in at the last minute and it was hosted in Athens. And then the next year in 88, was already scheduled Budapest that took place. So it was supposed to be uh, Scotland 84, um, Malaysia 86, but it was terrible what the South Korean government did. And then uh, Budapest in 88. So we missed 86 and had to scramble and then, then, then we did it 87 in Athens. So uh, the two key players that really, really assisted in Malaysia was uh, Gramasa Kim Bok Man and Wu J Lim, and uh, they were they were critical. Uh, their contributions cannot be understated, but it is not it is not accurate to say uh, sixteen were because um, even even Grandmaster Kim had told somebody else I believe that uh, back in the fifties uh, uh, he gave some. The feedback to General Choi about what on. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, feel guilty because when, when we were trying to uh, start this, this digging into this particular aspect, uh, somehow people took it for gospel truth that 16 patterns were devised there. That is not true. So we know the ones that were, were, were done before Malaysia already, you know, worked out. And we know that they were fine-tuned in Malaysia and then they were put in print back in Korea. So um, Malaysia, definitely the home, second home of, of Taekwondo. And uh, that was uh, General Trey's own words. Uh, so many people, Han Cha Kyo, Lee Byung Moo, Lee Byung Moo was one of Riki Ha's instructors, came to Malaysia and Singapore. and. Uh, uh, several instructors that eventually went to Australia and other places in Southeast Asia and around the world all stopped in Malaysia. So Malaysia was thriving as far as teaching goes. J.C. Kim went there. I mean, the amount of people that went to Malaysia as a stepping stone before they went elsewhere is another fascinating topic that needs to be explored as well. So. Uh, that, that's what I could add about uh, Malaysia. Thank you. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope you won't be sad or mad uh, at us, but we would like to uh, finish this meeting now, uh, here at this point. Uh, thank you once again so much for all the knowledge, all the answers, and uh, I think, and I'm sure uh, that all of the participants will have some more questions. Uh, but still, yeah, for now, after such long three sessions, I think we have so much knowledge, so much new things to talk about, to remember, yeah, and basically just think about uh, that. Once again, thank you so much, Grandmaster Vitale, for everything that you've shared with us. Thank you. Thank you all for your uh, kind attention. Uh, remember, uh, I did two versions of Lecture 1 and two versions of Lecture 2. All four videos are somewhere uploaded on the internet where you could watch or rewatch. And I'm sure this one will be uploaded as well. I might be doing another Session 3 questions only. So look at my Facebook page if that ever gets scheduled. And I'm happy to help any of you all do whatever you need for your schools or groups. It's, it's my pleasure to do. Uh, as I said, reach out for me anytime. If you have a specific question, you can ask it right on my Facebook page. So when I answer it, it will get the benefit of more people seeing it. Plus, plus it'll also be aired publicly so it can be tested by people because people might have uh, – uh, pieces of the puzzle that I don't or might have uh, learned it from a different perspective that can give us more insight. All this is important because Taekwondo's history is important for many reasons and we getting it right is important, equally important, and that's on us. H history already happened. We have to dig for it, but we have to get it right. And I certainly have done my best to compile as much as I can from various sources, but there's so much more that has to be uncovered. And uh, if you have access to those resources, you know, please, please help us out with that. And I'd be interested when people read or reread some of the other books that I recommended on Taekwondo history of, of um, you know, how you look at it now with a more broad perspective, because ITF people, they are, beaten into the head, General Trade did everything and nobody else is important. That is absolutely untrue. The ITF did not leave, uh, the, the WTF was not created because the ITF left Korea. The WTF would have been created or would have been taken over by Dr. Kim. So uh, uh, the, some of the things we've been told are just not true. So also, it's not true that Taekwondo's 2,000 years old. That is not even worth uh, responding to because it's it's just a out and out. I, I, I used to say fabrication, but I listened to the WTF uh, PhDs. It's an out and out lie. They say, let's just call it what it is. So um, if you think it's 2000 years old, or you think that General Choi is the, is the guy that did everything and nobody else counts, uh, you're wrong on both sides. And from a law enforcement perspective, we know there's three sides to every story, not two. Two sides is my side and your side. No, three sides is my side, your side, and what really happened. And what really happened is somewhere in between, not, not all the time directly in the middle, maybe it's more on this side or whatever, but it's in between those two versions. And when it comes to recounting history, remember, memories are fallible. Our brains are not perfect. And uh, we see something one way and we come to understand things one way. This does not mean this is how it was. So it's very important that we collaborate, we share knowledge and ideas, we ask each other questions, and we take from each other and keep building up. Because if we don't do it now, documenting this history, I'm afraid it will be much, obviously much harder to do later on. And I don't think anybody will be doing it later on. I think it will be insignificant. And then people 100 years or more down the line, we say, oh, yeah, it's something that happened in Korea and the, the military. And, oh, yeah, Chung Du Kwan. And, yeah, we heard about that. But they won't know these things. And that's a shame because my life is better because of my, my God, my family I was born into, and my religious upbringing, my academic education, and by my Taekwondo. So 
my teacher, Kim Kwang Sung, he impacted me as I am sure all of your teachers, whether they were Korean or they were from the country you lived or they were a transplant from somewhere else. We know, we know how our lives were impacted. We hope to impact our students' lives and martial arts lineage and heritage is important. It is important who your father is. It is important who your mother is. It is important who their parents were. It is who you are. So you as a martial artist is a direct, a direct result of the people you trained under. You should honor them by telling their story. And if we don't tell the story, who will? Who will? So we have a lot more work to do. And as I said, any questions, reach out for me at any time. If I can um, help you in any way, I will do that. I travel the world extensively. I don't take any money for doing what I do. So if I'm around or you want to invite me over, you don't have to pay me anything. I just love to share. It, uh, it great, gives me a great deal of satisfaction. It makes an old man feel uh, somewhat worthy or uh, appreciated by people. So you don't know what this has meant to me. Uh, I can never really repay you guys for giving me this opportunity. So I really thank you. So with that, I'm going to just sign off. Say thank you very much. I can, only, I can only second what you said, sir. Thank you again for three fantastic sessions. I also ask all of you if you can contribute uh, to Grandmaster Vitala's work. Just do it. I, I noticed there, there you still have uh, some questions or some suggestions. Use the Facebook. Write it down. We can discuss it. We can discuss the. We don't have to uh, spend more hours, even if, if they're really worthy. But we can, we can spend several hours more listening and discussing things. And we can also discuss things on Facebook. Uh, from our side, we can still, if any of you needs any help regarding the history of East or Central European Taekwondo, we are here to help uh, both from ITF and WTF sides. Thank you for being with us, to Grandmaster Vitale, to all of you. And see you somewhere in Taekwondo world. Stay safe. Keep kicking. All the best. And thanks again, Greg, for doing a great job with, with questions and answer. Thank you very much. And I will try to, to put the whole recording online as soon as possible. <coughs> thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grandmaster Vitale. Okay, you now. Much, you guys soon thank you, Grandmaster Vitale. Thank you. 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 See you now. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for another great um, discussion. Um, I think you need a part four, to be honest. <laughs> Too, many questions. Too much information. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe one day. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Nice seeing you here. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care, bye.